Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Working Words Podcast. On today's episode, we have a pretty awesome guest, Michael Simon, aka Dirt Perfect. So Michael has a pretty cool business. He runs an excavation business as well as many other things that we talk about in the podcast. He also is a YouTuber, so he is documenting all of his uh, things he does at work. Very interesting stuff. We talk a little bit about everything. We talk about everything from racing. We talk about steam engines, different equipment brands, different hand tool brands, different businesses Michael's been in. So uh, sit back, enjoy. One thing I did want to clarify, though, if you're watching this on the YouTubes, we did experience some technical difficulties, and there's about 20 minutes of visual footage missing. We still have audio for that footage, but towards the end, there are some gaps in the visuals. So Hopefully we'll have that straightened out by the next episode, but uh, enjoy. Let us know what you think. Do me a favor. If if you would, leave us an Apple rating and review. That really helps the podcast grow a little bit. If you think we suck, let us know we suck. If you enjoy it, uh, please let us know. Also, tell us what we can improve on. Tell us who you want to have on the podcast. These would all be great things, so enjoy. But as a kid, I would make my brothers pull me around in this wagon, and I would sell all kinds of stuff. Really? I was so fascinated by auctioneers. Loved them. Well, I, did, this. I thought, man, how hard can it be? And I got roped into being the celebrity auctioneer for some 4-H stuff. And I'm oh. like, boy, you want to talk about making an ass out of yourself. <laughs> you I'm, got, like, I'm towards the end, I'm like, who in the hell's got $5? Anybody got $5? <laughs> you know how people sing in the shower or going on the road? Like you just got to practice your auctioneering yeah, going on the road. Well, I, I like most things in life, I was very unprepared. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I've, been, I've always been pretty fascinated by him. Just the speed in which you can – Run numbers and also well, keep it, track of what where you're at. Yeah, and then to your point, it's like it's like singing a song. I mean, it's yeah. there's a rhythm to it. There's man. a ri- yeah, great. the good ones. It's like second nature to them. You didn't, it's like there's no effort going into but it. But whenever they're good, they start throwing some com- uh, com- comedy in there with it. Oh yeah, to get people involved. It's I heard there's one guy that would yodel. Yeah, that'd be interesting. There's a, there's a guy down home. He's he's pretty good. So yeah. Well, we're recording. I don't. I don't know if you oh. know. I hit record, so you guys start talking <laughs> about auction, and then I just yeah, click. Yeah. <laughs> Snuck that one on. Just having generic conversation over yep. there. Yeah, there we go. that's the way it's supposed to be, though. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we are sitting here with Michael from Dirt Perfect. So I appreciate you coming by. Uh, we started kind of talking about maybe trying to do a podcast what, about a month or two ago. And yeah. uh, just so happened to work out, you were passing through the area, and here we are. I think I reached out to you to be on my podcast, and somehow I ended up here on your podcast. Which yep. Is even <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, uh, yeah, what well, were we, like, three and a half hours apart, maybe? Uh, I mean, it's about three and a half hours to Louisville. Yeah, well, we're closer to four hours apart, then. Man, I got a lot of traveling to do today. But, anyways, <laughs> yeah. passing through your area, coming through, so happened to work out. You guys are raining down the field. And uh, I'm on the way home, so here I am. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for coming out. Passing through for work reasons or vacation reasons? Uh, I would call it more work. Okay. It was, uh, went up to, uh, man, I'm going to give him a shout out real quick. It's just, just awesome. I can't remember the name of the town. I think it's Browning, Pennsylvania, but it's the National Pike Steam Show. And uh, Matt from Diesel Creek uh, goes there every year and does a video on it. And uh, he was having a big YouTube meet and greet, invited myself and a few others up there. And I thought this is the perfect opportunity to take a few days off. Uh, I don't farm, but I do a lot of work for farmers this time of year. And it just so the timing worked out. About eight-hour trip farming, so pop the truck took up there. Had an awesome time at the show. If you guys are in that area, it's it's worth traveling for. That what was show. the name of the show again? It's National Pike Steam Show. Man, I would love that. See, my grandpa had a steam engine. Well, the ironic part is, is they got stuff... T- such tough regulations on steam stuff up there. A lot of it's just old shovels and drag lines and stuff. They got some steam stuff there, but it's just a... Oh, really? It's a bunch of antique equipment. I was going to say, the ironic part is there's yeah. no steam ah. engines. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I hate steam show it. <laughs> talking so, about, so talking they about didn't blowing have... the whistle and letting the steam out there. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't have any big steam engine demos or like... They really? Some stuff oh, well. They got to certify their boilers every year. Yeah. Because of an accident they had, which I get Well, it. a lot of steam engines anymore is probably more just hobbies. People have them and don't yeah. really, yeah, they're probably not certified or. And I hope I don't there. misspeak here, but I believe it's the largest collection of shovels and drag lines in the country. Really? And there, there's probably 30 of them and they're all operating. I mean, it's incredible. Wow. It's worth the trip. So, but uh, yeah, went up there, had an awesome time, huge meet and greet, great turnout, and uh, got some cool stuff. Sweet talk to some guys and let me operate some equipment. And the much you appreciate what you got today, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Also, uh, that short that I saw on your YouTube that was up there. That was up so there. operating that 
that shovel. That was yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. It looked like, was it designed, like the bottom dropped out of it, but was it more designed to push away yeah, from so you? Yeah, so that's or? what they call a shovel, and a shovel digs away from you. So it kind of goes in, scoops, and it holds the bucket up. Then you'd swing over a truck, and the bottom drops out, bottom drop. Okay. I think they call them tripper buckets, so they trip the bottom out. Oh, okay. And uh, then it would walk forward and completely go completely opposite thought process of an excavator. You know, an excavator, you sit up on top of your bench, and you dig back to you. With a shovel, you sit down in the cut, and you dig walking forward. Okay. So, would that be pretty hard to switch to? Um, yes and no. I mean, shovels are still common today in large earth-moving applications, a lot of times in mining and stuff, but they're all hydraulic, obviously. Right. Um, but they're still a pretty efficient way to do because you go out and pick up, and it's all one motion, and you're over. So whatever you're digging in, you got to come in, up, and then back out to the truck. So you've got a whole other... Gotcha. Whole another movement involved, and usually with a shovel, you can get bigger quantities of dirt because you can heap it up on top of it. Okay. So um, it, it's it's more of a mass. I'm gonna call it a mass excavating or a large ex- excavating tool. But uh, what just that, uh, I know we're getting off subject here. What flat amazes me is those old timers with that old equipment. Them guys can move some yardage. Really? Like there's a lot more operator input to make that stuff happen, but those things are no slouch when it comes to moving. Is that all cable driven? Yeah, most of I, it. I love how he grabbed the levers and you push them a mile to get it yeah. going. We're pulled way back and it's like, man, this is like, he's putting in work oh, yeah. making this sucker so, go. Yeah. So you're saying back in the day, operators were... A little, they, a they little were, different uh, than your joysticks. You move them just a little yeah, bit. There, there's it, nothing pilot control. Some of them, like the luxury ones, they, up, they, they did upgrade them to air controls, which would be like the old school version of pilot controls today. But, okay. the, but the real ones up there, man, it's uh, – one thing I learned with that cable stuff is you engage the clutch to make it go up or down, and as soon as you let off that clutch, the, your feet are the brakes. And if you don't have your foot on the brakes, something's going to hit the ground really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it frees wh- free it wheels. It's free wheels. It's oh, just man. Gone. That, is, that would be kind of neat to see so that. So if you're going to kick a clutch out, you better have a foot on a brake. That's okay. all i got to say. That's like rule on number one. So stuff like that, that's what they would have used to do, like railroad cuts back in the 1800s? Yep. Okay. Yep. I've always wondered that because there's, like, right across the road, there's an old railroad cut. And yep. Well, you, you look at some of that stuff, how they like, moved all that dirt. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's just mind-blowing. And, and you see it in... Like, you see it sitting still, and you're like, how'd they ever do anything with that? And then you see a guy, it's just like anything. You see a guy knows how to operate, and it's like, holy cow, man. Yeah. These guys could get her done. Crazy thing is, is, like, to get the knack of operating that piece of equipment is probably a lot harder than it is today, and that guy probably made pennies on the dollar. <laughs> like, the pennies, even for the time, like, yeah, he's probably the, still making The, the dirt. pennies on the dollar is for sure. You know, so I got very limited experience. I got to run a cable excavator and a cable shovel while I was up there. And the one thing uh, that kind of took me back a little bit is actually it's simpler to operate that because there's less movements. It's it's it's, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's hoist up, shovel out. That's pretty much it. Um, but the effort it takes to do that and the, the, the sensitivity, like there's some guys out there cutting grade with this stuff. I mean, I'm just doing good to pick up a rock. <laughs> right. But, uh, they, oh, man, don't let lot, them guys. A lot more start. effort to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Get, eating a burn a few more calories eating a little bit more at lunch yeah okay yeah i mean like i ran a good hard 15 minutes and i was i was pooped i was done okay. <laughs> <laughs> was the, was, the, was the climate control working no 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 oh, man you, you know, that's unacceptable it's uh, there was one up did there the radio like, have bluetooth uh, if you like the uh, what, the radio, what's a radio? They, yeah, that's uh, that, the only tune that I could get in was a Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> is that what powered them? A diesel? Well, if Detroit, you want to diesel. change stations, you just adjusted the throttle, throttle. a little bit. You know, you get a little different tune to the <laughs> a engine. Higher there. pitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no creature comforts oh, whatsoever. Yeah, I bet. But well, I tell you what, it sure to ha- sure beat the heck out of shoveling though. That's what we. Saw. They probably when they were running, they was like, "Man, this is nice." Yeah. Look, up, you I know. bet the old timers like you boys got it made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys don't even know what work is. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, we were sitting there talking. is like, look how far we've come in 100 years. Because a lot of this stuff's 1920s, 30s, 50s. And I'm thinking, man, where are we going to be at in another 100 years? You, you ain't know, a kid. Walking around with I know where shows. we're going to Well, I have a guess. Well, I guarantee you one thing. Instead of walking around out there with toolboxes, we're going to be walking around with scan tools and def injectors. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that you're going to be sitting in a building somewhere with running like, about a dozen machines. Like this soundboard being yeah. a control panel. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's pretty cool, you know. I'm I'm glad people got passion to restore all that stuff or keep it in operating order because it's it's um, it's part of our history, man. It's cool. oh yes, and a lot of the same principles and that equipment is still used today. Yeah, you know, as far as how they move and how they get leverage and a lot of that stuff. But 
Yeah, it was cool, man. I had a great time. It was awesome. I wonder if we should pick his mic up a little bit. I noticed it. Yeah, if maybe. If you don't have it pointed right at your mouth. Right well, actually, just tilt the whole thing, maybe. Oh, now I'm there making all go. the clicking noises. There we go. Is that yeah. a little better? Yeah. I just, if, <coughs> if like, when you're over top of it. You're a little taller than the last It wouldn't be a real podcast if we didn't have audio complaints. That's, that's like, true. That's, like, we're meeting qualifications here. We're checking boxes. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, I, I do think some people forget that uh, we are not, like you said, audio engineers. Yeah. <laughs> doing good to turn on the computer. I always here. like, I'm sure you've run into this too, whenever you meet people out and they think you got like literally got a film crew like <laughs> following you around and you show up a little GoPro 8 that's on a stick that's wore out, all scratched and beat up. And they're like, what are you filming with? And you're like this. And they look at you like you're funny or crazy or something. <laughs> and I'm like, so I did some video, um, did some work with Agco and they had an actual video crew come out and I got to talk to that guy quite. I mean, he was a one man show, but his camera, his one lens for his camera cost more than all the camera gear I have. Right. And I was looking at his stuff, and I was looking at mine. I was like, yeah, yeah, mine's covered in grain dust, scratches all over it, and greasy, and he's pulling everything out of nice cases and clicking them together, and, like, so, everything's well-maintained, and mine's just, I literally have a range bag, like an old range yeah. bag, and I just throw all my camera stuff in it. I don't just cover go. anything up. I mean, I always like telling the story. We did uh, some filming for Volvo, and they did the same thing. They hired this big crew come in. We were filming all these competitions, and there was, like, it was like a five- or six-person crew. They wouldn't put a GoPros and all the equipment while we were coming in and out and we were racing around doing all this stuff. We were all sitting back looking like, holy cow, like what do we get ourselves into? And then they didn't have no GoPro batteries. We we're like, we got those. We can save the for these. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing we do have, yeah, GoPro it's... batteries. So <laughs> it, uh, and I mean, I don't want to get too far off base here, but I get this comment a lot. Like, I think people like our videos a lot because they're raw and they're real and they can relate to them. Right. Yep. Our video gets too polished are too professional and it's like it gets out of touch or out of reach with them and they can't relate to them the same so i don't really do a whole lot to i may improve my editing and some camera angles and stuff like that but i don't get too carried away with getting too too extremely professional with it yeah do you film in 4k or 1080 <sighs> i guess we ought to back up and get to the point where you have a youtube channel what you do on oh, the youtube yeah, channel and all that good stuff we're kind of getting on tangents <laughs> <a little bit. laughs> that's okay we can we can circle back but you said you chose him as a co-host because he talks a lot so I Brian told you. may not get a word in edgewise oh. <laughs> <laughs> he started talking about steam engines and i seen his eyes go well yeah. we've been talking steam engines and we've been talking race cars yeah. off air. we're only 10 minutes in i may yeah. have a new best friend <laughs> Well, if you need somebody to go racetrack with you, I'm your man. Oh, I, I get up. This I have way. not been this year though, which is a big bummer. We're we're coming back to Atomic for sure. We're going to be up when? in. Um, I can't remember. It's on the schedule. <laughs> I'll I, think be there. I think it's in August. Okay. Uh, but I think the it's next one. Yeah, I don't, well, nah, the, it ain't the, that, um, Atomic's pretty cool usually. Oh my, uh, Lawrenceburg. We'll be in Lawrenceburg. I've uh, been there. Um, Memorial Day. That's a cool track. We're, that's we're racing with the World Outlaws again. Memorial Day. Okay. Monday. <clears throat> but uh, anyways, I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah, yes, sir. you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> Just keep going. Just keep going. <laughs> did he ask a question? I, I don't know. What did, what, what did he say? Yeah, I just figured we probably ought to start with, you know, your business and your YouTube channel. How, oh, yes. Before How we start started. talking about different aspects of your business and YouTube channel. That would probably make a lot more well, sense. Well, first of all, what, do you, what is it you do? Oh, that's a great question. How much time you got? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have wondered about that when I saw your YouTube. I'm like, man. I don't know. I can't decide what your special is. Like, it looks like you're into a bunch of different things. Yeah, I'll make this uh, kind of short and sweet, and I got some more details about all of this on my own uh, podcast channel. If somebody wants more details, I don't know why they would. But i um, been self-employed pretty much my whole life. Well, with the exception, I did work at a Mack truck dealership for a while and uh, worked construction for a while. But 2008, went out on my own, and I went into excavating business. It was kind of what uh, excavating and mechanicing was the two things I was passionate about, and I figured I'd kind of marry those two things together. If a lot of people know 2008 was a bad year. Uh, somehow that transformed into putting in home foundations. Okay. And uh, I quickly got busier in what I could handle, took on a, a business partner, and I kept the excavating business running on the side, but the construction business just took off. Uh, we had, I don't know, 15, 20 guys working for us at one time. Build new high-end custom homes, flipping houses, uh, had a bunch of investment properties. So you were doing the framing, too, not just the... Uh, yes and no. In the beginning, we were doing a lot of it in-house. Then we got so big, we started subbing stuff out. And then okay. we were doing a combination of both. And So, so you kind of serving as the general contractor in a lot yeah, of Yeah, and there was a lot of different versions of what we were doing. We specialized in ICF, which is um, energy... Or, um, insulated concrete forms. Like a lot of people refer to them as the big star foam Legos. You stack like the out. ones you buy from Menards. 
Well, no. not a big fan of that brand. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. A <laughs> little, bit, little bit better, probably. Uh, so yeah. we specialized in that. So in-house, I would do all the excavating. My construction company would sub out my excavating company. Okay. I'd do all that in-house. we do all the concrete work in-house. And then from there, depending on how busy we were, we'd kind of sub stuff in and out. And we did that for 10 years up until about 2018. And uh, just got hard to find help. And you're building high-end houses. You need high-end help. And... I just wasn't enjoying it no more, man. I was wore out. Like, we yeah. were just running ragged, didn't have a whole lot to show for it. What was the market like in that time? Because that was right after the real estate crash, wasn't it? Uh, so, in the beginning, it wasn't good. Middle years, it was decent. Uh, towards the end, the market was still okay. But and, and I had some awesome customers, and I'm not picking on anybody. And, and please don't take this out of context. But uh, it, you couldn't please nobody. Uh, expectations were just unrealistic, and well, I think ha- homes in general have kind of went that like homes are a showpiece. Yeah, like they're a style, and they're well, I would say right now it's even worse. With yes. well, with YouTube, with all the TV shows, yeah, YouTube, Instagram, HGTV. I mean, and then you, you mean got, the Woman's Outdoor Channel? Well, yeah, and then you get other ch- uh, like Mike Holmes. <laughs> uh, Mike Holmes has that um, you know where he goes in and, and tells you everything your contractor did or wrong. I can't Holmes with Holmes. I think is the name I've, of it. I've heard. I know. I know the name. I mean, yeah, everybody's convinced they're getting screwed, and everybody wants you know what's the old saying? Uh, they, champagne. They don't understand you. Champagne a taste show. and beer budget. You know. Yeah. Well, you just look at the price of homes compared to the, what they were. It's nuts what people it's, are paying for homes. It's, it's just it's become a real importance to people to have a nice looking home. So basically in 2008 or 2018, me and my business partner still have a good relationship. Uh, he had opportunities to go other ways. I wasn't happy running ragging. I got two kids. They were getting older. And uh, just kind of made the decision. I'm like, I do not care about money no more. I want to go back to doing what I enjoy, which is operating and working on equipment. I'm going to do that. And uh, should give you more time to be home with the family and, and just... Just chill, man. I like. I spent ten years running so hard. I was just. I was just it was wiped this out. Twenty eighteen when you made the switch, then. Yeah, twenty eighteen is when I made this switch. And then um, I got a neighbor that does YouTube, Logger Wade. Uh, he was actually on the History Channel show Axman at the time. Oh, and I didn't realize that he was on Axman. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was talking to the the production crew and Wade and Wade had been on my butt for years and years and years of the YouTube because he's been doing it for like fifteen years. I'm like, wait, I ain't got time, man. I ain't got time. He's like, oh, man, do it. You'll be great. And uh, I thought, you know what? I just shut down because we also had a – we had Simon Harris Construction, Simon Harris Development. We own 12 investment properties, and I had Simon's Concrete and Excavating. So development and construction shut down. It was back to the, the one original company. I thought, man, I got all this free time in the world. If I'm going to start YouTube, now's the time to do it, right? So I thought, I'll, I'll do it for a year. I'll do it for one year. I'll see if I like it. And this was 2018? This was the very, very end of 2017. This was November of 2017. Okay. And I thought, man, I'll do it for a year, see if I like it. And if I don't, I'll quit. And if I do, I'll keep going. And, uh, yeah, it kind of went berserk right there off the bat. I know whenever I started, you had 12,000 subscribers, because I remember finding you pretty early for some reason. That would have been fall of 18. Fall of 18. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. somewhere in there. And, um, yeah, so we went back to focusing on excavating. I do all my own maintenance, build a lot of my own attachments, do a bunch of work for farmers, and, and we do a variety of different jobs. So part of the channel's the shop side and the fabricating and the maintenance side, and the other part of the channel is kind of the on-the-job stuff. We do all of our own trucking. So I try to, going back to the customer aspect of it, I, you know, you show up for a three-hour minimum job and you charge somebody $500 to pull a bush out, they can't understand it. Yeah. So one thing I try to show on the channel is, is I got to pay insurance on this truck. I got to spend 35, 40 minutes loading this equipment up to haul to your job, unload it, do all this stuff, load it back up, run the maintenance on it and get it back. This is why it costs so much. What you've seen me do on your property was a third of what it took to actually get there and do that. I'm guessing people probably don't realize that by doing that job, you missed opportunities where you could have been making more money at another job, job, which is why you got got to have minimums. Right. Right. So, and, and a lot of people... Honestly, they're, I think it's kind of opened their eyes to a lot. Too. You know, I get a lot of comments about, you know, this makes more sense or it's nice to see the other sides of the business. And I don't get too carried away and focus on but the maintenance is in their big aspect. You know, we, I, I was going to ask about that. Being able to do your own maintenance is probably huge or fabrication or, you know, all some that. people, um, uh, some people comment that I'm wasting my time and I just need to hire that out and this, that, and the other, but. Sometimes it's not about money, it's about timing. If I want a job and I can fix something right then and there in the next hour or at least get it 
hodgepodge or together workable. enough to get through. Right. I mean, I'm like an hour from any dealership, so I'm looking at probably at least two hours where anybody shows up. Then I'm paying somebody to travel both ways. Yeah. And um, and and I enjoy it. You know, yeah. I, I truly do enjoy working on the equipment and. It's, um, I, I don't mind it one bit. I don't mind it at all. I, and I wouldn't want to do it all the time, but with the setup I got where I can kind of work on my own stuff on my own schedule, I, I, I love it. You get I to understand it. your equipment better and how it works. Yeah, and what so whenever makes it. you, you've got a great point there. So whenever it's in the shop and something's going down, you get out in the field and you have problems, you've got a mental understanding of exactly what's going on, or at least where to go to or what to do. So, right. Good point. Yeah. I'm a pretty big fan of that. I mean, I, I do all my own mechanic work as far as on my vehicles and, and, you know, a couple of pieces of equipment I have. And I like knowing how it works, what makes it go, and what, yeah, if something goes bad. Somewhat having an understanding anyways. Yeah, I've, I've hired very few things out, and maybe it's just bad luck, but the few things I have hired out have not. I'm, I'm went, right there with not you. Not went as planned. Ball joints on my truck. It's yeah. just, it was a nightmare. I ended up having to redo, put brand new ball <clears throat> joints in after spending $1,200 to have ball joints put in. Yeah. Truck being all screwed up. So that. I mean, before I did a lot of my own work anyways, and I think at that time I must have been busy that I hired it out. But after that, I'm like, man, if you want it done right, because nobody cares about your equipment like you do. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. And I'm fortunate enough, you guys that watch the channel, you know, that I mean, I'm technically, I got to use this term loosely, a one-man operation, but I got 20 pieces of equipment. Okay. So if something goes down bad, I've got a backup to it. So okay. I, I can afford to sit in the shop for an extra week until I get time to work on it. I'm not completely down and out, but... Um, but that's also 15 years of planning to get to that point, right. you know, and fortunately knock on wood, like we don't have major breakdowns. Like we do major scheduled maintenance, but a good mechanic, I guess <laughs> I don't want to jinx myself, but I mean, yeah. it's been a long time since we had something major and expected. So yeah. know, we, we run pretty hard sometimes. That's good. Brian's talk so much. He's thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> With your um, excavation side of things, is that something like do you bid out jobs, or I mean, has your reputation just got around to where I mean people know what you do, or like what's I guess how do you go about getting work in that in that business? So that's a great question. And from the day one, whenever I've been in business, I don't know if I've advertised at all. Okay. Um, well, there's like 130,000 people that kind of see it well yeah that was uh that was most of most of my construction career was before that but whenever we had the construction business i should take that back now we had the construction business we maybe did some generic advertising you know the local 4-h or the local newspaper or something like that but nothing nothing major but we've always been able to stay busy by word of mouth and you do a good job for this guy he tells his friend and and so on and so forth um I'd say our work is probably, <coughs> excuse me, fifty percent T and M and fifty percent bid. Okay. Um, a lot of the bigger jobs are all bid because people want a budget number. Um, you know, I do a bunch of work for Farmer Chris, and it's like field openings or just random stuff. And you know, I it take more time to drive out there and bid and talk about it. He's just like, just go do it and charge me, and he knows that I'm gonna right. Yep. Be fair there's to a trust him. there. Yep. He knows I'm going to be fair to him. And, and, and there's several other people around home. It's the same thing. They just call me up and say, hey, just get it done. So I, I mean, I'll back up on that. I'd say 50% bid. 50% is just, they don't even ask. Just go do it. And, okay. Or uh, 25%. And then the other 25% is probably just t- teaming him. Some stuff you got to do teaming in because you don't know what you're going to get into. Because um, if I had to give a bid price on it, it'd be so high, I'd probably scare him to death. But if we get into something and it's, more than I think it should be, I'll stop. I'll call the customer and say, hey, this is what we're into. This is what it's looking like it's going to be. What do you want to do? Do you need to pump the brakes here and go to plan B, or do you want to keep going? Or, or, you know, just keep your customer informed, and usually you don't have problems. Yeah. Have you had uh, – I, I was asking you that as far as, like, bidding and stuff goes. Have you ever had any jobs where – maybe made a mistake on the bidding? Or, I mean, how do you learn, Are you I guess? Are trying to ask me if I've lost money? Well, kind of, yeah. I mean – Let's say you're putting in a parking lot for Olive Garden, and all of a sudden you've, you know, you're way over budget. I mean, how does that aspect work? In- I mean, I'm a man of my word. If I tell you it's going to be X dollars, if I tell you I'll do, I'll put the parking lot in for ten thousand dollars, and it costs me fifteen thousand dollars to put it in, I'm charging you ten thousand dollars. Okay. Um, how do you get? To, I mean, how long did it take you to get that skill of like putting a bid together and you know being pretty 
close on your bid, I guess. Um, I mean, is that just a learned to skill? To go or? back to your parking lot thing, though, real quick is, now, if we start digging your parking lot and there's something, I always tell everybody I don't have like a crystal bar x-ray vision, there's something neither one of us knew that was there, then we're probably going to have a conversation. But if I just flat miscalculated or if it's blatantly my fault, then I'll eat it. It's yep. just, it just is what it is. You know, bidding, that's a... But that just from, like, my business, I mean, I don't have to worry about that, and that just seems like something that yeah. would be kind of scary to me. Um, so, first off, if you're putting something out for bid, and all you're looking for is the lowest price, you might as well add 20% to it, because it's going to cost that to get somebody to come finish it up for you. Uh, I lost a septic tank job uh, back for, it was a, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think it was a $15,000 job. I'd, I'd charge, I was like $2,500 higher. And um, I told the guy, I said, I ain't coming off my price. I said, call me whenever he's done. I'll come finish it up for him. And uh, <laughs> guess what happened? I charged him $2,500 to finish the job. Yeah. Because I knew he wasn't going to power wreck it. I knew he wasn't going to seed it, straw it, cramp it. And make it mobile. We had to haul seven loads of dirt in just to make this thing mobile, you know. Did the guy do what he says he's going to do? Yeah, he put a septic system in. But it wasn't finished. So, I guess from the customer standpoint, you know, sometimes cheaper is not always always better. But, you know, bin jobs is – some stuff's easy, like tile. Just kind of give a per foot number. And, yeah, I mean, that's pretty uh, – yeah. But, um, like, building, bidding houses back in the day, that could get tricky because they changed the types of – countertops or the types of cabinets or the paint or drywall or flooring or stuff like that i'd say the most complicated stuff we bid now is probably site work like for a new home as far as uh, footages on driveways and the amount of yards we're going to move to build a driveway because we're not quite to the point where we have 3d models and stuff so we're kind of taking some assumptions on that and usually i <clears throat> i got in my head what i can do in a day per piece of equipment <clears throat> so i kind of base base it off that a little bit and, um, I mean, to be honest, if you're going to bid a job, you're, you're going to put some cushion into it yep. to make sure you're... Oh, yeah. Sure you're you have to, especially with the amount of equipment you have. Like, I did finish work, you know, for homes, and I even put a little bit of cushion in, but I didn't. I had relatively no overhead compared to you, so... The beautiful part about a bid is everybody's got a number. Right. You know what your profit should be. The customer knows what the bill should be. Um, the bad part about it for a customer is it's always going to be higher than a T&M. You know, I, I got some yeah. friends that won't even do T&M jobs because they feel like... When you say T&M, what do you mean? Time and material. Oh, okay. okay. Um, you know, they feel like they're always leaving money on the table, which I get it, um, but um, it's everybody does stuff a little bit, little, bit, little bit different. But, I mean, the flip side of stuff, I've lost some big money on some stuff, and I've also come out smelling a little better on a few than I thought I was going to, so I, it kind of washes as out As long as you bit. average out. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my saying has always been, I have no intentions to retire on your job. I just need to make enough money and get to the next one. That's, <laughs> that's my goal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because if you take care of your customer and do what you say you're going to do and uh, keep good communication with them, and I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm, not saying I'm perfect. I'm, I've screwed up some relationships and some jobs over the years. But if you do your best to do that, yeah. Pretty good chance you won't have to spend a, one advertising dollar because the next job will be, be coming in. Right. This is kind of mine. Well, in this day and age, if you just show up and do what you said you do for well, the hell, price. Just show up. Yeah, so you'll have to show, show up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's. Now, you're, with you're, all that being said, I do love working for farmers because they're like, I don't care. Just get it done. This needs to be planted tonight. Oh. <laughs> so, it don't matter what the finished work looks like. It don't matter what the brush pile so looks like. My cousin, um, he does concrete and stuff. And. He basically got all of his uh, his early skills from working for us because that's how dad was. Well, I don't have to be party. Just yeah. get it done. Yeah. And then he'd you know, bitch about how the concrete looks. <laughs> <laughs> well, why did you put a broom finish on it? Well, dad, you told him just to get it done. Like yeah. First couple of jobs I did with Farmer Chris, you know, I'm out there at the D4 getting these little dry dams all perfectly manicured and everything. He's like, you realize I'm getting ready to drive a disc over that, right? <laughs> I'm like, got it. I'm out of here. I thought you said you like working for farmers because they got deep pockets. Well, it depends on the year. Apparently, oh. fertilizer is expensive or something. I don't oh, know. Yeah. I've heard every excuse in the book this year. I'll tell you <laughs> what. <laughs> so, well, I, I can't vouch. Fertilizer is pretty high. <laughs> so, no, I don't. Uh, uh, the other thing farmers don't mind, as long as you clean your mess up, you can work when it's wet because they want you out of there when it's dry. So, right. especially in the spring, when you need to get stuff rolling, it may be too wet to do other stuff. 
a lot of times there's a job somewhere you can go do for a farmer, you know, a field entrance or a culvert or a little clearing or a fence row or something like that. One thing I've noticed working with anybody that's self-employed in an industry that's, I don't know, not real techie or I, that's probably not the right word, an industry that's not in like an office space, like mm-hmm. an outdoor industry of some sort, are generally the same kind of people, it seems like. Or I usually jive pretty well with yep. that yep. kind of person. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Everybody's kind of got the same mindset a little bit. And in my opinion, they have common sense. Right, yeah. I mean, that, that you might, might just, have to have, yeah. yeah. That's where it still exists at. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I take that over intelligence any day. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can go down that rabbit hole. Oh. I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think you guys got enough time for that. Yeah. Um, so have you ever like been stiffed on a job, or has that happened pretty commonly, or is that you know not too I've bad? been? Did you ever get told to pack up and leave? No, I've oh. never been told. That. I had that happen to me one time. I, it's come close a few times. It's come close a few times on some home builds, but um, I'm 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 a pretty committed guy. Like, yeah. I, and I'm a. My wife will probably disagree with this, but I don't want to say I'm a people pleaser, but I like to know that I left there doing my best. Like, if I get told to pack up and leave, I want to know in the back of my head I did everything I possibly could to make it right. I didn't leave under any stone unturned. But um, I've been had some slow payers. Um, I've had one guy on a $25,000 job short me $2,500. And the old saying that karma is a beep. Uh, I thought, you know what, I'm not going to push this. I'm just going to let it slide for a little bit. And sure enough, what goes around comes around. He got what was coming to him. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but um, I've been pretty fortunate, man. I've um, been real fortunate, actually, that never really had any major major issues with getting paid. You know, um, like I said, I got some. And most of the guys that have been slow payers have told me, hey, I'm waiting for this to come in or this needs to happen. There's a line of communication. Right, there. Yeah. right. And um, – Farmers, I need to sell some grain. I'll get you paid and I'll sell some grain. As long as I know what's going on, so I can kind of budget for it myself. Yeah, I'm not a big deal, but you know, another one of my sayings is I'm a lot of things, but a bank ain't one of them. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of need that money to keep going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I need to keep operating too. Yeah, uh, to keep going. So, I, yeah, I've been pretty fortunate in that aspect. Not really been any major issues. Talking about uh, getting shorted at that twenty five hundred dollars and what goes around comes around. So. My uncle, uh, he did a home build. Actually, Monroe mm-hmm. built the house for him, but Monroe did not do the dirt work in the basement for him. Well, the guy that did that, um, well, he's got a small excavation company. I don't know if I don't know if he does concrete too, or he. I think he subbed the the concrete and the block out. But anyways, he he was just an excavation company, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he dug the dug the basement, but he was the one. Like my uncle was paying this man, and he was the one lining up all the materials and all this stuff. And I can't remember what he ended up paying him, but uh, got the basement done. I mean, it looked halfway decent. I mean, everything was timely. Well, he goes to get, like, he goes to do something with the financing part of this house. and This was after the house was finished, wasn't it? I thought it was after the basement was finished and he was going to do the rest of the house. Oh, possibly. Okay. Because there was a lien on the house. Mm -hmm. He's like, what in the world? I mean, the land was owned free and clear. Everything was paid. I've seen this song and dance. Yeah, before. his basically he paid for somebody else's basement. Yep. And uh, let's just say that my uncle did not have that theory you had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's probably. I wouldn't be surprised if that guy didn't have some flat tires. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably a little bit bigger number than I was dealing with. You know, the other thing you got to be a little bit aware of, and I'm curious about your take on this, is you get so many of these uh, homeowners that want to be their own GC. Well, how are you to do this? Not how are you to do that and do this. What a lot of people don't realize is is a ho- is a GC is a referee. So you're talking about general contractor. General contractor, sure. yeah. So a GC is a referee. So whenever the plumber blames it on the electrician, you got to be the one that goes in and decides who's doing what. Because otherwise, the, the the homeowner don't know how to play this game, and the homeowner is hiring those guys one time. Yep. The GC is hiring this guy repetitively. He has a relationship with him, yeah. right? So I'm him. like, damn it, Joel. You know you drilled through his pipe. Tell him you're sorry, and I'm going to get John to come over here and fix it, and we're going to go on to the next house. We're right. in the well, that, There's probably some motivation to keep getting lined right. up by you for future but in, work. But in, and I've seen this time and time again. I'm just using this for an example. But in the homeowner world, this is catastrophic failure. <laughs> 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 like stuff is bad. The, the plumber screwed me because this guy, you know, I'm like, no. Somebody just needs to go in there and get the two kids and have some milk and cookies and get this figured out. It's not that big a deal. It happens all the time. Yeah. So, anyway. well, it seems like in any, any business, if there's two different entities on the same job site of oh, any right. kind, 
It's always the other guy's yeah, fault. The, the finger's always pointing. So I see that. Like He shouldn't have put the pipe there. Like yeah, if, I, there you go. The like HV, if, HVAC with, guy always got the duck working in my other plumber. and everything yeah. else. With farming, like if you're pulling brand X's implement with brand Y's tractor and there's some kind of issue there, oh, yeah. each side's blaming the other side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I put a DeWalt battery on my Milwaukee drill and I cannot figure out why it don't work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Speaking of that, I did notice in the one video you talked about the yellow. How much you liked it, and I figured I had to bring that so up. Call Brian, <laughs> Brian's a big red guy, and he well, gives see me our, see our lighting here. Well, that, yeah. I'll tell you what, man, I'll give you this. That red one worked like a man. It was awesome for the whole six hours. Oh. Like that six <laughs> hours was the best six hours of my life. I might have missed this video. What happened here? Uh, so I didn't. I didn't see it. He I just, can't he, say it for I, you. May know contractual reasons, but the red one gave me a okay grease gun, and it worked awesome for six. It's about six hours. It's like three tubes. And it broke? If you call not working no more broke, then yes, you're correct. So <laughs> I got By a By the red one, you must mean Harbor Freight. I got it. Exactly. Got it. Chicago <laughs> Electric. Bar, oh, yeah, the, I, yeah. I think they got a reddish. I'm looking. beginning to learn it's the parent company. So anyways. <laughs> <laughs> they do look very similar. I've often wondered if their batteries are interchangeable. Uh, so anyways, Slap you know, you follow their protocol and you, you give it nothing. Crickets. Oh. This went on for like six months. Well, aren't they months. supposed to have a three-year warranty? Yeah. So then I, uh, Brian Hammond, which I think yep. is a mutual friend of ours, he's like, well, give it to me. I'll have my m***y guy replace it. I'm like, good. I said the name. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say you just. Uh, so <laughs> I, 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 can, I can beep that out All right, for so you. I give it to him, and he's like, oh, that serial number goes back to so-and-so, and we can't do nothing with that. you got to go through these people. I'm like, what? all right. Is this through the marketing department or something? Yeah. Is that why? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, oh. Scarlet or whatever her name is. But, um and, and honestly, I've had a bunch of their tools over the years. We do a bunch of big stadium jobs, and some, some of the equipment they got holds up hands down. There. Here's my take on red versus yellow. Um, Just what, for the listeners, we're not talking about tractors. We're talking about no, hand we're, tools. We're, yeah, we're all over the place. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're talking tools. about power tools. There's no off subject on this podcast. They're, no, though, is we can go down any rabbit hole both, want. They're both really good tools. The, the red makes some tools that are way better than the yellow. I think the yellow makes some tools that's way better than the red. The yellow stuff's a little bit cheaper. And it shows up in the quality of the tool a little bit, but you get what you pay for with each. Yeah, it's it's that simple. Well, I I also think once you commit to one, I mean, once you have that's one, you thing. commit because of batteries. Like you said, you can't interchange well, batteries. So people that's, always, well, why do you like brand? I like Milwaukee. I yeah. don't know what brand you guys are talking yeah. about, but I like Milwaukee. Um, I think that's the Burgundy one. Yeah. <laughs> people be like, well, why do you why do you use that instead of uh, Ryobi or whoever? Yeah. Like, well, because I have. 60 of these batteries exactly. that fit this tool. Right. Well, that's what, when we shut down the construction business, we had six crews. They all had yellow ones. Yep. And, of course, I hodgepodge everything together to one good kit for myself. Had a whole bunch of batteries. It's what we had. Just yeah. kept rolling with it. And um, I'm not I'm not here to – I do think the uh, yellow one makes a way better drill. Their, their half-inch drill is – it'll kill the red ones. Uh, like an impact or a no, like an actual cordless drill. Okay. We, we use the speed binders, use them on the speed binders a lot, mm. and the, the the red ones will not hold up. I like the yellow one side grinder a lot better. The head on it's way smaller. You can get in a lot better places. Uh, the neck's a little bit longer. It's not near as bulky. You get into red. Red will kill anything in the impact. I mean, red impacts are just like hands down better than anybody else's stuff. The circular saw on the red is light years above anybody else. The saws all is way better. The red has a lot of their cool stuff that yellow don't offer. So, it, I mean, yeah. just pick, flip a corner and pick one. Yeah, you I know mean, what I mean? When it all comes down to it, they're all better than the old uh, NICAD batteries. Yeah, yeah. I remember the old uh, Makita when they first came out, and you load the, the, the thing in the uh, the battery in the, in the pistol grip yeah, handle, pistol, yeah. yeah. Things like this long yeah. and hanging <laughs> on everything. We used to have just a fleet of old Craftsman cordless yeah. drills, and Dad eventually just quit using We just... Plugged the extension cord everywhere because they yeah. sucked. <laughs> oh, they've come a long ways. So in 2004, I was in Bush Stadium. I was 22 years old, I believe. We had to take 67,000 seats out of the stadium in 19 days. <laughs> and we had Craftsman, Milwaukee, DeWalt, Makita, Ryobi, Rigid. Like we had, I think we had close to 400 cordless impacts running. We, I bet we, that was noisy. Wow. We, we had, and of course, this was before lithium batteries. So we had uh, folding tables with ice on them. So you would, <laughs> so you'd melt the table? No, well, so you would cool, uh, cool battery the batteries. Oh, so yeah. you put, so you, everybody would bring their own batteries in and lay them down these tables with ice. 
you have to dry them off so you didn't fry the chargers because we may have smoked a few of those and, <laughs> and just keep cycling through. And um, uh, Hilti. Hilti is the only thing that would hold up to that. Really? Every, we blew through everybody's everybody's stuff. And uh, Hil- and you don't – I never even heard of that one. I was going to say you don't hear about them anymore. Well, that's because it's about $700 in impact. They still make them? Oh, yeah. They I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, Hilti cordless stuff. Really? Especially when it comes to like three-eighths, quarter-inch, and half-inch impact. Do they make snap ones or something? Uh, no, I don't think they do. Okay. But uh, Hilti, man, I'm telling you, there ain't nobody that can touch stuff when it comes to Hilti and cordless. Here I thought red and black was one of the best. Huh. Uh, in that application, red held up better than yellow. Oh, red and uh, yellow, yeah. But um, I mean. actually, Makita was probably right up in there at that time. Of course, this is 2004. And, and, yeah, this I was going to say, years, years ago. ago. Yeah. I feel like some have taken off and progressed better than the, the others. The power that they have now. I mean, like, we take off tractor tires with them. Yeah, and, it's insane. Yeah, yeah I mean... We have a three-quarter inch impact that we lug around sometimes, or we just get a fresh battery on a cordless half-inch yeah. drive impact. And that's that's so much better. Yeah. I need to get one of those. So, but to go back to full circle, actually, the red one, why it lasted, I really like because it was faster and it had two speeds. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and the center of gravity, seconds. this sounds crazy, but the center of gravity is so much lower. So if you lay it down, it don't always fall over. But it was short lived. Well, that <laughs> sucks. I I have that exact same one. I mean, I could let you borrow mine if you want. If you want. It grease up before you leave. Six can, hours can, later. Will you warranty it for seven <laughs> tubes? <laughs> I'll I, have to say, have, I would have to have two batteries and a charger too, please. <laughs> I will say the customer service of the yellow has been a couple of issues that I've had. Like I had a battery to go bad, and it was, I don't know, two years old. And they just sent me a new one, no questions asked. Didn't even, I didn't even have to send the old one back, so... I feel like that's important, even, yeah. you know. Anybody can make a tool that fails, but if you stand behind it, it's... Well, it's, my experience with the other one, and it, which is crazy, because I think it comes down to the who you know and the part of the country you're in, because some people... Maybe. Some people swear up and down the Reds got the best customer service, and then oh, your, yeah. your, your experience with that... I got uh, another battery that went bad, so I'm about to find out if it's just a... Now, on the flip side of that is, we still to this day run Hilti stuff in the stadium business, and our Hilti rep steps by once a month. Really? Goes through all of our stuff, and... I don't know. I got to try Hilti Impact. I never oh, do they make like a quarter inch nut driver? They make those. Man, interesting. You'll, I'm about, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing one thing that'll prove that it's more uh, powerful is because, uh, okay, on a stadium seat, I don't, I'm going to go way down a rabbit hole here, but you got two pieces of plastic, the back and the bottom, right? Right. And if you guys have ever paid attention, most of the times they're held on with an aluminum bolt. Mm-hmm. It's a special aluminum bolt. It's got a big Allen screw head on the top, and then it's like a carriage bolt on the bottom. And what they do is, is after they run that bolt through, they break off the bottom so it don't catch your leg. So right. whenever you sit down, the seat's folded up, it don't scratch you or catch anything. But if they break that bottom off, that nut will never come off the bottom. So whenever you go to take these out, <clears throat> you actually over-tighten them and break them. Okay. So that's what we're doing with these quarter-inch impacts is over-tightening that bolt and breaking it off. And it don't take a whole lot to do it, but if you get a Hilti impact and you buy a Harbor Freight cordless extension adapter like the 3 8 socket, it'll never last. Really? Any other brands, you can run them for days, and it won't. You run it on a Hilti, it'll, it'll, within three hours, it'll break it off. Wow. Do they make a, a lot of tools, or is it just in? Oh, yeah. They like, make. if you were a carpenter, could you find a whole line of tools like saws and all that? Huh. Yeah. Well, Hilti's known for the uh, hammer drills. That's what they're famous for, is okay. hammer drills. But uh, they've slowly started developing stuff over the years. I mean, I'm not going to lie. They're expensive, but they're, yeah. they're, they're worth the money. They're, hmm. good, they're good stuff. All right, so I don't remember where we were <laughs> anymore now. <laughs> we, we got way off did track. We ever, did we ever finish talking about the youth? I think, I, he, I think he was referring to me greasing my excavator and discussing. Uh, the, the yellow. <laughs> every, well, it don't matter. You pull the yellow one out, everybody thinks you should have a red. When you pull a red one out, everybody thinks oh, you have yeah, a yellow one. So everybody. I'm like, so, I think I made some goofy joke about I can't find my red one or something. Or well, I just had, when I heard that, I'm like, man, I got to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, you can't please everybody. I made a, just a, a quick reel on Instagram the other day. I got a case of Bushlight, um, Bush oh, the the John Deere beers. Yeah. Well, I don't drink Bushlight, and I mean, I just—it's not my thing. Right. I like Coors Light, so I bought this case of. I knew if I put them in the office, somebody would drink them. So I bought a case. I grabbed one can, took a drink out, threw it down, said, "Yep, still tastes like shit." And I opened up a Coors Light. <laughs> the amount of people that are pissed about that, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yep, hit a nerve there. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, it's crazy. It's I, I enjoy the even the rude comments. I still enjoy because they just make me laugh. I'm like, 
like they they have so little information about what they're actually commenting about and they're so passionate i'm like what what are you talking about I mean, it just <laughs> oh, cracks me up so. and if you were just a casual follower or watcher you look you see the comment and you think like man this guy really knows what he's talking about but you really don't know how much they know what they're all talking you, about you want to see some haters put a roof on a on a house oh yeah you got a lot of those didn't you oh yeah, yeah i learned that yeah no matter how you do it you're doing it wrong so the one thing i want to do is you always get the safety nazi right the guy that's going to call in ocean epa and everybody on you and oh, oh dad yeah. loves those guys so here's my thing is it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm reckon i reckon your dad's not the biggest safety so whenever i bid a job for him i want to bid it according to that because the price is going to be like six or seven times of what it would be normal i can't bid that on a regular basis because i got a bid versus my competition right right we don't do anything that we feel like is risky or dangerous or anything crazy like that so if you want me to follow all those rules, you're going to have to pay me to follow all those rules. So guess what changes real quick? Well, can we knock a few grand? Yeah, we can go backwards here a little bit, bud. But uh, anyways. Eliminate the helmets, helmets and the harnesses and all yeah, that. So huh? anytime I climb the grain leg, I mean, I, I don't wear a safety harness. I don't condone that for everybody listening, but I don't wear one because I don't have one. And when I do have one, I ain't putting it on. Usually I'm in a hurry. But that's your choice. Yes. And I tell them every time, I'm like, listen, if I fall and die, I won't show you. <laughs> You're never going to know. <laughs> I'll I'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll ask Kayla for the input. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I mean, there's just yeah blatant stupidity, and then there's everyday farm life. You know, it's uh, it'd be different if you if you force somebody to go up there without a harness. It was uncomfortable to do it. But it's yeah, not, it's, it's the not people, like people don't realize I'm the one paying the bills here. Yeah. This is my grain leg, like <laughs> my house, my body, my property. Yeah. Right? Yeah, especially if it's on your own property. Yeah, and and I mean, yeah, it is it is what it is. I. Uh, I, I don't know. It just cracks me up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, I always get a kick out of the – we used to have a bunch of uh, union auto workers back home, you know, and then they started buying Toyotas because they were cheaper. Like you realize Toyota is not part of the auto union, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the auto – the union auto workers would buy it. Yeah. Non- oh, okay. So – are the, are the same guys that, you know, work these big union jobs, but then they go shop at Walmart because it's cheaper. Yeah. I'm like, you're kind of talking out Shoot. both sides of your mouth. Shooting bit. yourself in the foot. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I hear you're passionate, but if you're going to be passionate, let's live it on out. Let's yeah. just not do it when it's convenient. Well, like on your construction or uh, excavating, uh, you run various different kinds of equipment. How many times do you get people giving you shit for running like a Hyundai or something like that? Um, A little bit. You know, you get the guys, well, I'd, uh, buy an American or get something yeah, made in America. Well, the problem is there's no excavator made in America no more. People think because um, it says John Deere on the side of it, it was made in Iowa or something. Yeah, and then, you know, you want to go back to the auto thing. Uh, I seen a statistic the other day. I think the Toyotas are more American-made than any other vehicle out there right now. Uh, I mean, like right where we're at is a, is a foundry, a machine shop, assembly plant. There's like two or three of them with right. I mean, Kentucky the, Truck Plant, or is that the one you're talking about? Well, Kentucky Truck Plant is uh, actually Ford. Oh, okay. They do there, but there's a. They all, Toyota also has one in Kentucky somewhere. Yeah, yeah Georgetown. I think it's Georgetown, Morgantown. The, they got one there, and they got one in Gibson County, but. Okay. Um, it's. Um, the uh, the is it the XMG excavators I believe, they're actually sending those over here in containers and then they're assembled here in the United States, which that may be the closest thing to American that has the most American labor put into it. I don't know. Caterpillar still does some stuff somewhere. I don't want to speak too far out of turn, but um, man, I, I mean, it. it, it what is. what's the fault of that? Like who who's supporting the, the, the consumer? The consumer or the the big business? Whose fault is that? I think it's a mixture of all the above. To be honest with you, it's it's the way. Well, it, it, instead it, of going from uh, my personal thought, would not getting too far away, is instead of going from a country run economy, we went to a global economy. Right. Is whenever we go to a global economy, it's you know everybody starts getting dependent on everybody, and and it works if everybody's getting along and everything's available, but then. You know, a, a virus sneaks up, or somebody crosses a property line they're not supposed to, and yeah. stuff goes haywire. And then we're all sitting here looking at, you know, we're not self sufficient no more right. because we're all in this in one big group. So, I feel like going back to how you talked about the union auto worker buying a cheaper. They probably bought it because it was cheaper, right? Yep. So and in force. order for the auto workers, automakers to keep up, if as that snowballs, they had to do something to make it more affordable. But one thing you got to remember is. And I'm not saying regulations are bad, but we've regulated ourselves out of industry. 
Okay. Um, so you go to um, other countries that don't have the regulations on how you dispose of stuff or the hours you work right. or the age you can work. I don't want to get too crazy down a political path here. Well, they can do stuff a lot cheaper than us. Yeah. They got more resources at their availability. Their workers uh, also don't have a union. Yeah. Well, and, so that's the main driver between of them being able to produce products cheaper, you think, is just the right. less regulations. Our, our, larger, our larger quantities in a shorter amount of time. Um, yeah. So we got to find a way to balance regulations versus cost. Right. I guess is the best way to teach that teeter totter. It used to be, you know, regulations weren't nothing at all costs get it done. Yeah. Now it's we're we're regulated to the point where we can't cost effectively do anything. So we got to get ourselves balanced back out here somewhere. That's my yeah. Uh, and there's got to be some compromises. I mean, I'm all for safety and saving the world and. Global right. warming, you know, anything. Well, you don't do. want to be reckless by no means. Yeah, but, but does any of that matter if we're right taken over by a third world country and there's nothing here to live for? I yeah. Don't know. I mean, where, where do we. Where yeah, you, you definitely can't have a one, just focus on one thing and just the, that be the most important thing, right. not care about the repercussions of that. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not a politician and I'm not claiming I got all the answers. Well, we got to. We're out of balance. That's the best way I know how to describe it is we are out of balance. We need to get back into balance. For sure. So when are you going to run for president? <laughs> Never. <laughs> right. Remind me later to tell you guys a story about that. Anyways, <laughs> no. I'll write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what you were doing in your first YouTube video? Yeah. I was hauling a piece of equipment, my 850J, into a job for Farmer Chris, and I knew I maybe was working on something I shouldn't be working on. So I thought, like, man, I can't film the job, but I can film getting there. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and uh, it ended up being a little bit more exciting than I thought. I had to unload on a county road, and it was raining. I unloaded on some boards, and the thing just perfectly slid off the road into the uh-huh. ditch. So I'm like, that works. <laughs> Good start, I but, guess. Uh, but, yeah, that was my first, uh, that was the first video was uh, trucking, uh, moving, moving, moving dozer. What yep. was your uh, expectations when you started, and how was, how was that compared to reality now? So, oh, that's a good question. So, I don't know if I had any expectations. I set some goals. Um, I'm one of those guys that, even if it's a hobby, somehow it's got to justify my time. So, my goal was is to do it for one year and hit the 1K, 4K, which for anybody that's not a YouTuber, that's the threshold to be monetized. So, if I could get 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours in the first hour or the first year, I was going to be content with that. And then in the second year, how many ever hours I put into it, I feel like it needs, needed to justify my time. Uh, that was kind of my two things I had in mind. I think I got monetized in the first two months okay. I was doing it. Wow. And, um, That's pretty good. Yeah, and then it took off pretty quick after that. I how, mean, How often would you put a video out? So in the beginning, I was doing like two a week. I did that for about six months. And uh, so I put one out every other day now, and I have for ever since then. But, uh, like, I haven't edited a video in probably three or four weeks. Well, I noticed some of the videos that were recent are from back in March. So you you have kind of a backlog of... It's time management. It comes down to time management. So um, I knew busy season was coming up, and we film. I get a rainy day or an off day. I'll film, I'll post, or I'll, I'll put them as a uh, schedule. Them. If anybody don't know on YouTube, you got uh, private, unlisted, right? And I can schedule them. So public, you guys all see. Unlisted, I can send a link. People can see. Uh, then you can actually schedule it, so I can upload it. And I can say I want it to post it this day at this time. Right. So with my crazy life, I can't promise I'm gonna be able to run home and edit a video, upload it, get it all done. So I'll kind of, uh, usually my schedule is, is I'll film all week on Wednesday I'll, or on Sunday, uh, I'll edit, sit there and watch NASCAR race, edit videos, and then I'll schedule them out. But like this time of year, we've been so busy. I got like seven SD cards that are full. I haven't started editing the first video, but we hit a little rain spill here. I'll just sit down at my desk, knock out seven or eight videos, upload them, schedule them. And so what do you edit on? I edit on my iPad. Okay, so do you use Luma Fusion also? No, I use uh, it's called Kind Master. Uh, okay, it's uh, I've seen you a few of your videos where you're sitting in the line at the uh, is it ADM Cargill Cargill. Um, it's very similar. Okay, very similar, but I do it for the same reason because it's mobile. 
Um, like traveling, it's easy to pick up and take with me. If I know I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to be sitting for a while, uh, pick it up and take with me. Um, I do, once I get it uploaded onto YouTube, I do a lot of the back end stuff on the desktop. Yeah. As far as the uh, actual editing part, I do it on my iPad. Gotcha. And it's, uh, it's worked out good for me. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not by no means a, uh, an editor, I mean, but it gets it gets me by. It works. That's the way I look. At. I mean, I'm doing a vlog. It ain't. Yeah. It's not a. You know, it's not going to win any Academy Awards or anything. But I mean, well, I think vlog. yours is the same way. Like all the basic features are right there at your fingertips. And if you see something you want to do fancy, you can find it on the back end and and make it happen. And it's a. Uh, oh, when I watch like the how to videos on Luma Fusion's website, how to do stuff, and I look at like their sample timelines I'm like there's a lot more stuff happening in that one than mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there's no joke but uh my big thing is is i save and i'm curious what your take is on this my my thing is is is, is i save all my time in filming if that red light's flashing it better be something i can use oh and a lot of times i'll go through and um and just clip video ends or put pieces most of the time i know what's in there now the flip side of that is and i think you're running the same problem is one of my guys take my camera or your dad's got the camera? You have no idea what they filmed. I got one guy, man, behind the scenes. Like, he is guaranteed every clip can have something inappropriate in it just to see if it'll get through. <laughs> 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 so that slows me down a little bit because yeah. I got to find the find well, the Easter egg. Well, that's one thing I was going to ask you. Like, So I can edit a video pretty quickly, but I usually, like, right now my videos are a week behind. I don't like it being that far behind because the events are no longer fresh in my mind. Like, you're editing stuff from, like, Three or four months ago. Yeah, three or four weeks ago. Isn't, isn't that a pain in the butt? I, I guess I've just done it and got used to it. You know, I hate that my videos are somewhat behind, but it's the only way I can do yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah, the only way that. I can do it. Um, um, no, I mean, every once in a while, it, like once I get into editing the video, my memory gets jogged and I kind of go back to the moment and knew what was going on and I know what I want to make okay. sure I got in there or not. And I'm sure you're kind of the same way. Like you start off the day with a video in mind. And you kind of, every video needs to tell a story, right? I yep. think that's what makes a lot of YouTubers successful over others. Some of them just like pop the camera up, show something, and don't yep. really explain what they're looking at. They show something cool, and they don't really end it, and it's down, right? But you got to gotta start the day off. I think you did a pretty good job of that as well. As here's what the plan is. So you kind of got, you know, your storyline. And somewhere in the middle, you naturally, you don't have to make it up. You naturally got to struggle, or the plan changes, or something breaks, or the weather moves in. Yep. So, you know, we got a little bit of, I want to call it drama because it's not drama, but you got a little bit of a question in people's mind, like how's this going to end? You know, they're going to get it for the rain. You know, is the tractor going to hold out? You know, yeah. And then you got to have a conclusion. Um, you know what what actually happened? So um, I, I try to kind of keep that in back in my mind. Like what what's the plan? How did it go down? And then what was the what was the end? And I was it in reason I try to do them like per day. So. Uh, yeah, I can't stand it when I'm filming and like 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 you say I got this plan in mind what's going to happen, and for whatever reason something happens and you just go off a totally different direction. Not even that. Like I, there's no longer any work to be done that day, and that now I've got two minutes of a video. Right. It's just like not having any structure there drives me crazy. Yeah. Or like we're planning on working, it starts raining, all of a sudden the wife wants to go to Columbus and do something or whatever. It's just. There's no longer any content there, and it's just like it, it drives me crazy whenever I go to edit that video and I've got two minutes of footage to put into another clip. But right. I, I think the other thing that served me well, which is probably one of the most simple editing tricks I could tell anybody out there, like if you're sitting there editing that video and you're getting tired of watching that clip, so is everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Move yeah. on. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's time to speed it up. It's time to cut it out. It's time to cut change that it. Clip yeah, and it's, start time to, it's time to move on. and. And uh, that's where, you know, like, remember my guys are filming for me. I'm like, a minute clip, that's it. Right. Like, if you filmed over a minute, you need to shut it off, find a different angle, find something else, put the damn camera away. Like, don't, like, Aaron used to uh, just turn the camera on and film for 15 minutes. That's what that's does. hard to edit that. Oh, yeah. it's miserable. That's, you bought, well, like, you didn't film it. Like you said, you don't have to watch all yeah. 15 minutes and be like, okay, what now, part of that yeah, do I need I to use? And I finally got the guys. I'm like, listen, I said, if you got something you want to see or watch, I said, click it on. I said, try to keep it under a minute. And then move on to the next one. If you want to show more, turn it off, walk around, get in there, shot, take it, you know, and keep going. And that that helps me big time when it comes to uh, editing. And it also helps the the video keep moving. You know, it, it piecing all those short clips together kind of keeps you keeps you engaged to it. So, 
Yeah. My thoughts, my opinions, anyways. Yeah. Do you ever feel uh, any kind of, I guess, pressure to have some kind of content when you're working? It's like one thing, like right now, planting season, for example, sometimes I'll feel like, man, I haven't said it. Like, I'm doing the same thing all day, and like it's pretty, like, I know what I'm going to be doing all day. Right. And I don't know how many times you can show different angles of a planter, but there's not a whole lot of them where they're still captivating. <laughs> and it's there's almost like there's a little bit of pressure to try to bring something to this video that's worth watching. Right. Like, do you ever have that? A little bit. I mean, one huge advantage I got over you guys is, is I, like, rarely do the same thing more than five that, days in a row. I was going to mention that, yeah. Uh, with, and honestly, the closest I've probably come to your examples is with this tile plow here recently, you know, plowing all this tile time and time again. And um, I got a couple different takes on that, you know. So let's just say um, let's just say we're plowing tile for the fifth day in a row. So and I need a video. So I will have the tile plow in the background, and then I'll go off on some random tangent about bidding, or some random tangent about something else, you know, that people want to know about, and just kind of use that as background noise. Like yeah, I guess for an example for you, maybe you could go on your thoughts about fertilizer prices and predicting what that's going to do and just kind of do that as planning is going along. So if I got like 10 days of tile plowing and I only feel like I got three days with a good tile plowing videos, if I need a fourth video, I'll kind of use it as background noise and, and do something else with it. But it's, um, it, it gets tough. I mean, it, like, it's like Wade said, how many trees can you cut and make interesting? You know what I mean? Once you've seen a couple of trees cut, you kind of see all the trees cut, you yeah. know? <laughs> So you yeah. got to find a way to put a little flare into it or change it up a little bit. But I'm uh, we do very little repetitive stuff. So I, I well, feel just like, like the little excavating we do, like running a bulldozer. Well, I almost need someone following me around with a camera to make this interesting because, right. like, the in cab shot of a bulldozer is pretty limited. Like, there's not a whole lot <laughs> that you're gonna see yeah. from the cab. I will say I've enjoyed uh, your videos about like the in cab, just seeing your hands move and mm -hmm. how. Like, I've run an excavator one time in my life. And just oh, we can how, fix that if you want. Right across the <laughs> road. <laughs> so one and thing. Um, how natural it comes. Like, that thing, everything's so smooth. I'm like, man, if I was doing this, it'd be like, the bucket would tilt, the yeah. arm would tilt, you know. It, it'd be a whole sequence instead of, it's like second nature to you. So that's kind of cool to see. I don't remember who even told me this, but the, but I got, after I got to thinking about it, it made a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> Is I don't know what your analytics look like. But if you plant this year and then you film planting next year, there's a pretty good percentage of your watchers that never seen you plant. So it's still oh, new. Yeah. it's still new to them. And then uh, about fifty five to sixty percent of my viewers are returning viewers and the forty percent are always like a rotating door of forty percent. So yeah, you need to keep it fresh and new, but then the, the the flip side of that to his point is is we take so much stuff for granted that we just automatically know whether it's farming or operating or stuff. And man, I've, I had a lot of compliments on just explaining the basics, like what the function of the excavator does or talking through while we're doing, I mean, to us is just so simple and so elementary, but you know, a lot of people watch us have never sat in the seat right. or never experienced it in real life that, uh, and I, and I've, I've learned that from also going back and watching videos I'm trying to learn stuff about that I'm the guy that knows absolutely nothing. And sometimes the the goofy guys talking my language is the most helpful video uh, versus the expert that's talking over my head, you know, yeah. a beginner uh, expert level whenever I'm the beginner. But I think that's where the um, creative juices kind of flow a little bit about how to, you know, just do something to keep it new and fresh or intriguing. Or, and it's... Uh, I mean, you do it long enough. You how many years you've been doing it? Uh, it was twenty eighteen. So oh, so we're about the same. Yeah. about the same boat. So yeah, it's uh, it. I don't know. You, you like let's dig eighteen and wait. And some of these guys that have been doing it for you know ten, twelve years. My hardest thing is coming up with creative titles that aren't just complete clickbait at this point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure I've got multiple of the same titles. Because I do the same thing every year. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, but if it's and, a year later, who's going to... Yeah. yeah, but like you're just trying to make it fresh and exciting. And like your title and your thumbnail is what's going to get your new audience. Right. Yeah. And, and I think I think the, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in your title is is another. 
you know, like another day planning or. Oh, yeah. So it's like you need to find a way, you know, I don't know, come up with something. I, I noticed pretty quick part two that doesn't work. That don't work. That's what yeah. I was getting ready to say, part two. You might see a part one video that has a million views. Part two might have 100,000. Well, yeah, because then they feel like they got to go watch the other one before they watch this one. You know yeah. what I mean? It's uh, even with my tile plow videos, we'll be on the same job, like four videos on that. First the, one's always the best one. Well, you know. It seems like. Yeah, but yes and no. I'm going to use a different example. Uh, we did a big lake job where we cleared all the trees around it, and then we busted the dam and took the thing out. We were on the same job forever, but the titles were all over the place. You know, one was, you know, searching for a, um, a lost homestead pond, and that was the land clearing video. Uh, the next one was busting the dam in, in a controlled fashion and erosion control. That one did good. And then Seems it, like busting dams. And that, I was going to say, that one popped right up whenever I searched you. That, yeah, that video the, was right there. But any, it seems like anything with da- busting a dam or a flash flood, any kind of title like that. I mean, that I'll be honest with you. I wanted to click on it and watch that water. You know, <laughs> I, did, I, I, I wanted to watch you know more how many comments I get in that video that says, man, I got to pee now? <laughs> <laughs> like a big old gusher. Yeah. Right? But, you know, it's uh, our tile plow. You know, it's uh, like... I don't know. One day we were, I think it was the great dig. We were doing with the excavator. And the next one's like, well, the tile plow put an eight inch tile. It's the same. It's the exact same job, just different day, but just trying to try so, to make the title sound like it's a different day and a different job. Does that make sense? So you think labeling it, you know, something instead of part two tile plow, part two of the great dig, you think that that, that will affect it? Cause that's what I did on my videos. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I noticed a big drop off, but I just thought, you know, nobody followed yeah, through. I think, you know, we had the great dig and then the second part of the great dig is, is will the tile plow well lay eight inch? I think anytime you can ask a question in your title, okay, it automatically intrigues people to want to try to watch it because they want the answer, right? Yeah. I did that on one of mine, though, and it didn't do nothing. Yeah, well... Your so, videos are a little bit more how-to, though, so I feel like yeah. having a part one, two, and three series makes more sense. Well, I know that, if I learn, try to learn something, I want to know in what order I need to watch it in. Yeah. yeah. Well, and to your point, but I had a guy to explain it to me. The other, it's like sometimes posting YouTube videos is like playing golf. You put a ball on the tee, and you hit one, it kind of goes off on the right, and you put a ball on the tee, and you hit one, and it goes off the left, put a ball on the tee, and it goes in the sand pit. Then you hit one that goes way down the fairway, and you're like, "What I do different? I swung every time." Right? Uh, well, you're right about that. So, yes. and then you, and then I feel like the longer you do it, the more good hits you get. But I mean, I thought there was just bad balls. No, I, I, uh, it ain't the balls. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't know if anybody's ever figured out the magic of making YouTube right. work, but. I think keep trying is the biggest thing. Keep swinging. You know what I mean? Like, if you're, you seriously want to make a go at it, I think you just got to keep going. Yeah. That's probably advice I should take, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, Monroe hasn't uploaded a video in a year and a half. Well, so here's problem one. No content. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. Now, see, now you tell me. <coughs> I thought you had a friend over here. <laughs> Well, you know. That's, you know, my wife will upload a random video like once every two months of making fun of me. 100,000 views. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? So this winter, I probably I'm gonna uploaded talk to my wife. less videos than I've uploaded probably since my channel has took off. Uh, we went on a couple vacations, and to be honest, there just wasn't anything that was worth filming, right. I didn't think. Sometimes you just need a break, too. It felt really good to take a break. Like, I don't think I really edited a video for, like, two weeks, and yeah. that was that was very that's, resetting. That's another thing nice about my schedule is, is I'll go two weeks without filming or editing because I just need to I just need to chill out. You know what yeah. I mean? I got to warn you, that's how I end up with a year of no content. <laughs> I had a schedule before I took vacation. Yeah. Well, I did, too, but then once the schedule ran out, I was like, man, really got to get this you job done because this, 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 this house stuff. needs... Well, so we renovate houses, flip house, whatever you call it, and... You got to kind of get them done before the market yeah. crashes in, or dips in the fall, you know. Yep. Yeah. But I don't know. I guess it's just priorities. You're also, I prioritize and sleep too Also much. became a dad. You know so. what excuses are comparable to, right? <clears throat> Belly buttons. <laughs> Everybody, well, everybody's got one. I was good at well, You got the <laughs> point. Other, <laughs> you got the point. <laughs> That's the PG version, yeah, I guess. But yeah. You, yeah. So, you ever so. get in, in situations filming where it's awkward? And I know we've talked about this before, but. Like if people's watching you, or if the the homeowner's watching you, and it's like uh, he's gonna hear me say these things about this job that maybe I don't want to talk about in front of him. Well, no, because I'm kind of to the point where most homeowners know I do it, and they look forward to seeing the videos. And most homeowners actually like it because it kind of documents their progress, and okay, they can send the link to their friends and say, "Look what we done in our house." And uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
the actual name of my company, Simon's Concrete and Excavating, and I actually had to DBA myself, which is doing business as Dirt Perfect, because some people thought it was cool to get a bill from Dirt Perfect. Oh. <laughs> oh, was, and by the way, I don't know if we mentioned his uh, YouTube. It is Dirt Perfect. Yep. Okay. That's, we also didn't name your podcast or any of your, uh, that's any all, your social media. We can get that, that at the That's end. not what I'm here for. So. you got to listen to the end for that one. Yeah. But uh, I had one, this, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. He's kind of a family, he's the brother of a family friend. Like, I know the guy, but I don't know him real well. <clears throat> and I uh, I show up on this job, and I hop out of the semi, I'm getting ready to unload the excavator, and he comes flying up here on his full wheeler. Did you bring that damn camera with you today? And I'm thinking, oh, God, where's this going to go, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, no, 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 Paul, I left it at home. He goes, you better go back and get it. We're going to make some of those movies today. Oh, <laughs> man. Well, actually, Paul, it's in I'm the back like, pocket. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I didn't know which way this was going to go. But yeah. uh, I've had um, I've had a handful of them. Like, they're a little cautious about, like, their location and where they're at, which I'm always – I don't – don't ever mention names. Don't ever mention price. Don't ever mention location. Right. That's kind of the standard standard thing to do. You have to respect our privacy. Right. Effect. And I've had other people say, "I don't want you filming." And if it's not a good, good money job, then at this point in my career and where I'm at, I, I got to respectively pass on it because that's you're losing money on that side of things too. Yeah, and that's uh, uh, that's big money. One of my drawbacks, and I don't know, maybe this isn't a thing, but you know, where we renovate a home, and whenever the buyer sees <clears> the end product. I'm a little bit worried about if they ever find this video and see what it looked like before we started, would well, you be I'm like, gonna, oh, my gosh. I'm going to call you out on that a little bit. If you're proud of what you've done, you should be showing them the video. Like, this is what it is. Yeah, this but they'll, they'll see what it looked like. I mean, they, they may think that, you know, I don't know. Is that – you don't think it would turn people I, off? I see that the opposite way. I mean – I don't know. I guess if there's blood stains on the floor and cracked needles. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. But, I mean, it's um, – like, if I was still doing what you were doing, we'd be documenting and posting and using it as a sales tool. Okay. Like, hey, look, this is but what But you also built new, though. Well, we did, we did the same thing you did to some, but I would, I would be looking at that as, like, this is what we started with. Mm -hmm. These are the steps we did to fix it right. Right. So you can have peace of mind. Bam, here it is. You I think there's it. something to that, because it seems like as more shows and stuff have popped up, I mean, it's I know countless place. people that think they're house flippers, and I also know that they probably don't have the skill set that you have to actually yeah. do a house Well, flip. every every uh, uh, farmer, house flipper, excavator, everybody's got hacks in their industry. Right, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it's just the reality of it. Yeah. So. I guess I guess maybe I've, I tune in, tune into the YouTube comments too much of how I'm doing it wrong, thinking that the homeowner's going to be like, man, he didn't do yeah, that. So I'm going right. to flip that around on you one more time. We get a lot of work off YouTube because people see us do it right and like okay. the quality of work we do. So how many times does that open you up opportunities to buy in houses or other opportunities too because they can see you're doing it right, you're putting, you know, you're taking pride in what you're doing. Now on the yeah. flip side of that, do you get YouTubers that are keyboard warriors telling you you don't know how to operate or you're doing this wrong? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I can wipe my own butt in the morning without failing. One, but I mean, do you uh, worry about like some, a potential customer seeing that and thinking, "Well, this guy seems like a legit operator," and I he's mean, telling if, him he don't know what he's doing. If a customer watches my videos and thinks I'm not a qualified operator, I don't want to work for him. It's that simple. I mean, that's I've been doing this long enough that I can talk to a customer for five minutes and know whether I'm going to do that job or not based on them. Because I, there's just certain keywords, certain phrases, certain things that they say, I know where they end up at. Yeah, And I walk away from a lot of jobs over a few cues that I catch because I know it's just going to be a headache. And fortunately, I don't want to sound cocky at all, but fortunately I got enough workload that I can kind of weed those out and go. I want to work for people that um, are appreciative of the quality of work we do for them. Um, Makes our, probably a lot more enjoyable experience. Right. You know what I mean? There's nothing worse than doing the best of your ability and knowing you did a good job and somebody's convinced you're still screwing them. Right. I'm like, I'm out. Like, Starting to sound like my wife. She really likes it when people buy our houses that love the home. Right. We actually canned a deal recently because the guy just was picking it apart. And she's like, you know what? You don't love it. You don't need it. Yeah. And it's like. You know, he had the money, he's ready to go. And this there's like, a lot of truth to it. You know, there's nothing I, you know, and what what you can't tell that customer is, is like, you don't know how good a job you got and how lucky you were to hire me. Yeah. Like, let me step out and you go hire somebody else. There's been three different occasions I can think of where they've begged me to come back and finish. And they're like, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm out. We had a job this spring that was like that, you know, and nothing I could do was right. 
I got my bid part of the job done. He went into a little patio area, leveled off, and wanted a water line ran up the hill. I'm like, no, I'm done. I ain't doing it no more. I told him. I said, I ain't yeah. working for you no more. Right. And he got all huffy puffy. Well, blah, 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 blah. well, guess who got a call six months later to go finish everything up? <laughs> guess who also had a different attitude? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. it's, um, and like I said, I've done it long enough. I've been self employed for 17 years now. Yeah. And I've learned a lot along the ways. And reading customers is one of the things. And I, the people we're talking about, such a small percentage of the people we work for. I don't want to act like this. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, I'm so fortunate to have some. Awesome, oh, I, awesome, I, I fully awesome agree customers. with you. How long did it take you to develop, like, I guess the vision of what you're going to be doing? So, like, what I mean by that, like, I could run equipment, and for the hours I have, I think I could run equipment halfway decent. Dad is a pretty pretty good operator. But one thing Dad has that I don't have is, like, he can look at something, see it in his head, and know exactly how it's going to look when he's done. So, um, to go into your story there, there's two different things. There's operators and there's excavators. So an operator can hop into a piece of equipment. He can move those controls. He can do the coolest tricks. He can pick up eggs off bottles. He can load trucks. He can make all the movements. He can make that machine do anything he wants to do. A good operator. An excavator can get into that machine, and he can see that canvas out there of what needs to be done as far as uh, this dirt needs to end up here, and that slope needs to go in here, and we're going to end up with a ditch here, and we don't need to put that there. That's where you make your money. That's where you become efficient is seeing the whole big picture. Seeing the picture. Right. Yes. And I don't know if you can teach that. I think it comes with experience. You know, okay. I, I, would, I would say it probably took five to seven years before that really truly started clicking in my mind, like seeing, like knowing what comes next and down the road. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm still learning every day. I got an old guy that operates for me, Jerry. He's probably about your dad's age. And uh, we get on a job. I'm like, Jerry, this is what I'm thinking. And sometimes he agrees with me and sometimes he don't. And sometimes he just goes off and does his own thing rogue and I watch. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But um, that is there, – there's a huge difference between an operator and an excavator. And I think that's what you're trying to explain a little bit is knowing how to move the dirt once, especially the fuel brush. Just to clarify, I cannot pick up eggs with an excavator. <laughs> <laughs> so you're neither then. No, no. <laughs> But, that but, would be my biggest drawback as far as, or my biggest weakness. I could learn how to run the piece of equipment, but I'd be moving dirt three, four, five times compared to you probably because yeah. it's hard for me to envision what goes where. So, so dirt guys, guys that move large quantities of dirt, like excavators like myself, every time we watch a landscape proper equipment, we cringe. <laughs> I hope, I hope I Cousin mean, Ben listens oh, to this. We cringe because these guys will massage this dirt into a big old, if you know what I mean. Like, they're over there rubbing on this stuff and moving it, and I'm like, what? Just get to, uh, out of the way. Yeah. Uh, which they... They are true operators. Like, they can really mold and scope, and they're artists, you know, and stuff like that. You put them on a big job and tell them to go move 10,000 yards, they'll be there four times longer well, than anybody. Well, so, when I, my cousin, who is a landscaper, landscaper concrete guy. Landscapers are excellent operators, poor excavators. Well, uh, what you're sorry, saying is sorry, ringing. Sorry, 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 cousin Ben. <laughs> what you're saying is ringing very true, because whenever I watch him, like, he's moving just at a snail's pace. Oh, yeah. Everything's pretty. Oh, yeah. But it's like. Can we just go? Like, I yeah. got shit to do. Yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's like, no matter how slow you go, we still have the same amount of work to do. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Like, <laughs> let's, let's root and gouge, and we'll polish when we get close to grade, you know? <laughs> that, that'd be me, though. Like, I have a skid loader, so I do my own. Like, if we have a driveway to put in or something yeah. like that, I like to do it myself. But part of it is because... I've had people do it, and it's like, man, it, you know, it's not, but, it's but not you're as moving, pretty as... You're putting it, I mean, putting it in a driveway, you may move, what, 20 yards of dirt? Yeah, if that, yeah. You know, with... Uh, well, like, I'll go in with a tiller, and I'll till it up, so when I bring it up, it's a nice powder, and it's it's right depth, and, and when I'm done, it, it'll look pretty good, and I don't have gravel scattered everywhere in the yard, so... Yeah. Uh-oh. My wife called, shut the recording off. So I think we were talking about uh, excavators and landscapers yeah, and operators. Yeah. So I was asking you, you do a driveway job. What do you move? Maybe 20 yards of material? If that, yeah, barely. Yeah, I mean, I'd say our average job is seven to 10,000 yards. Yeah. And we're trying to do it in probably the same time you're trying to pull that driveway. Yeah. Well, for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have a lot more time to do this driveway than you would, of yeah. course. 
you, know, you don't have a guy with a planter up your butt. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah, trying to tell me that every day we go past this, I'm losing yield. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can think you can plant across that. Go for it. You, live in, I don't care. you live in Southern Indiana, right? Yeah. Time to cool his biscuits. <laughs> 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 this isn't Northern climate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, speaking of that, real quick, were you guys close to that? Well, that you had that manhunt for that guy that. Yeah, about an hour away. Oh, really? Yeah, actually, you got yeah, to I, fill me in on this. This yeah. guy. Well, his wife broke him out of prison, didn't she? Yeah, she was oh, a warden. She I've was seen, a warden. Okay, I've seen that. Was the, a bad deal. I don't know where he so, broke out, uh, of, but he ended up. In Captain Southern Kleeman, that works for me. You guys watch my channel. He actually is a fireman in that town where they okay. where they got him at. But uh, I, I I've been so busy here lately. I haven't been keeping up with it a whole lot. But yeah, we're about an hour away from that. Okay. The uh, tornado that went through uh, Mayville, Kentucky, only went about twelve miles south of us too. Oh. Wow. So we found a bunch of random stuff in the fields and still finding stuff in the fields. Found some pictures and stuff the other day, plow and tile. So. Really? Wow. Yeah, speaking of plow and tile, like one thing that was pretty interesting about your channel, you made your own tile plow. We did. So we did. beans that we put in field tile from time to time on YouTube, the amount of people that told me, why didn't you just make one like Dirt Perfect? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that's whenever you really made it on YouTube. There's never people start referencing you on other channels. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, being, being in the excavating world, I always get compared to uh, Chris Let's Dig 18. So every time they're like, that's not how Chris is doing it, my favorite response is, who's that? Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris called me one day. He's like, you have got to quit telling these people this. He's like, they're blowing up my comments. I'm like, you're welcome, buddy. Yeah. Algorithm boosters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I guess first off, do you get the question all the time, like, why is it called tile and what's it for? Uh, I mean, I try to cover, like, a lot of people tell me that I'm an idiot for putting it in the ground because it's just going to fill it with dirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean. So I try to cover that pretty. I'm assuming you guys often. use knife slit tile. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so it's originally called tile because back it in the day. It was clay tile. Yeah, it was clay tile. So we usually hit a clay tile about every time we put a plow but, in the ground. Yeah, and it, it is still, uh, we had a clay tile factory in our hometown, so it's all over us down there, too. But uh, a lot of those old tiles, if. The only reason they quit working is because usually somebody damaged them, being a farmer or a piece of equipment or something like well, that. Well, I mean, a lot of them weren't very deep. Yeah, true. Because they were, putting they were in my taking hand. them with a shovel. Yeah, put them in my hand. But, Unless uh, they were real if, fortunate. If, if the tile's put in right, the purpose is to control groundwater, and the ground is a filter. So once it's in there and left alone, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen one put in properly that's ever silted in that I've ever dug up. I don't know about you. Um, the properly part could be the the X factor there. Yeah, you get a low spot in it, or you get something done wrong, it'll silt in a little bit. But so, uh, well, that's one of my questions. Off air, you were talking about wanting that tile to be just perfect, mm -hmm. like the grade. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a dip in it, that could cause it to well. Like, seal. You have a four inch pipe. You better not have a five inch dip. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, even though if you're running downhill, if you have the five inches of runoff, it would run out. It just have a It'd kind of be like a trap, yeah, so but, but you're saying that that dip will gather dirt maybe? or well, what? Anytime water stops moving, it settles. So okay. if you keep the water moving, it don't have time to drop or deposit its settlement. Okay. <clears throat> so to Brian's point exactly, kind of the unspoken rule, um, and maybe this is the, my rule I made up, is if you put a four-inch tile in, you should never be more than two inches off grade. Put a six-inch tile in, you should never be more than three inches off grade. So half basically you still got half your tile capacity. Ideally... I think you want to be plus or minus an inch no matter what. Right. Um, we try to stay plus or minus a half inch, uh, but I'm not saying we hit that all the time. We do our best to say. But the the reality of it is, is it makes unfarmable ground farmable. Um, and it allows you guys to get in the fields a whole lot quicker, especially in some wet stuff. Uh, I know down home, we've got a few more hills than you guys got here. So we got, like, especially fields that are, like, foothills. We've got a bunch of bleed water coming off the hills. And they'll keep fields soaked till middle of July. Yeah. Uh, rot the seed, you know, don't get germination and stuff like that. So uh, I, I've i just been kind of slowly getting into it over the couple of years. I actually built a special bucket for the excavator to put it in. It's only uh, eight inches wide. We could do, on a good day, we could probably get like 250, maybe 300 feet an hour with it if it was easy digging. Uh, you know, we still dug it in the old-fashioned way, but... Basically, this year, uh, we got a job where we had to put in about 60,000 feet of tile, and digging that in just wasn't an option, especially as flat as what it laid. Uh, this one laid pretty flat. So so when you were digging in, were you using just a transit? Or, yeah. Yep. The yeah. old beep, 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 beep. Yep, the old beep, beep, beep. And, um, and you can get within a half inch with the excavator? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, impre that's, that's impressive. Pretty, I can't that's get pretty, that close with a shovel. 
Yeah, I dug out. That eight-inch bucket was a big help for that. Uh, actually, it's harder with the eight-inch bucket. Really? Yeah, I just you figured you'd have less dirt in the. You bottom. can't see the bottom of the hole, ah. so it's all 100 percent by eyeball off the top or feel. Uh, okay. With the bigger bucket, you can actually see the cutting edge down there. With the smaller bucket, especially if you get deep, like four foot deep, it's really hard to see. Uh, so it, it kind of turns into more of a feel thing. <clears throat> and actually, on tight grades, we wouldn't use that. When we'd use that bucket, like running up a hillside or something, where you just know you got fall and you just need to maintain depth and go. Do you uh, have the transit on your arm? or you Depends have on how tight we need to be on grade. Okay. If, if we need to be, if it's less than 1%, I usually run a grade rod, man, because there's there's just too many variables involved. Oh, so speaking of that 1%, is that, so let's say you go a foot. We do it over your, 100, so. Um, okay, 100 foot, so yeah. 1%, so. A be 10 inches over 100. I okay. think that's the way it works So it, it's, it's percent of fall versus the run. Yeah, okay. Right, right, right. I've always wanted, I've thought that's what it was, but I wasn't sure. So, uh, anyways, I reached out to a few Talfa plow manufacturers and um, had a couple opportunities there. Uh, you work with Soil Max, talk to those folks. They make a really nice plow. I uh, talked to Bomalite, a few other ones. And uh, no matter what I did, this plow was going to cost me a substantial amount of money, and nobody could guarantee, guarantee me a delivery by spring. And I'm like, well, kind of committed to getting this job done, so i got to figure out something. So I looked at the user out, couldn't find nothing I like. So we just decided to build one. And um, uh, basically got an 850J John Deere dozer with a ripper on the back of it. And we made it to where it just pins right on top of it. Three pins comes on and off. And, um, man, it's uh, it's worked awesome. I'm not going to lie. We've uh, had a guy from Texas come up. We built a grade control system for it. And uh, we've plowed over 3,000 foot runs, never been more than three eighths of an inch off. I mean, it's that's pretty impressive, it's just spot on. So, you know, my goal for building this is I wanted to spend less than 10, I wanted to spend less than $7,500 on it. I ended up having about 10 grand in building it, and uh, I, I needed to get through this season. If it just got through this season, I'd be fine. And uh, this thing's gonna live a long life. I mean, it's got through the season. We were hoping to put 60,000 feet in with it. We've put over 100,000 feet in, and we still got another 20,000 feet to go yet this year. So it's, it's, got, it's got... I like to, how you just uh, slap the transit, I don't know what you call the end, that's usually on the stick. You just slap it on the yep, power pile, and you just go by the... So we got is that all manual, or is it... Well, that, so we got two different ones. we got what we call a laser chaser, which um, it, it locks into the laser, and it controls solenoid, solenoid valves on the dozer, which it'll automatically do it for oh, us. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I run the magnetic one, is like an insurance policy, so I can see really quick if I get off. Like if it skips a laser, or so that'd somebody. be like our, a depth chain on a regular tile plow. Yes, exactly. When I run one of those two in some situations, so I, I just like having multiple references because so I can kind of compute those all in my head. And so that's and, more just a reference, or make just a double. Yeah, and then there's certain scenarios, like if it's a short run, or like uh, sometimes I'll just I'll run manually off that. Like I'll manually control it, just watching the lights on that thing, but. Usually on those long runs, we'll just – I'll hit the automatic. once you get the tile off, <laughs> there's no fixing it, is there? No. Well, yeah, there's How one. would you? Would you? You'd have to go beside it and lay a new one maybe? Well, there's one video. We went and dug up about 100 feet. Cause, oh, so, okay. Because we got off. But uh, most of the time, you abandon it and just plow next to it and okay. chuck it up as a loss. But yeah. I only had to do that once this year. Have you ever had to do that, Brian? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, anyone that says they haven't, it's lying. Yeah, they're lying. <laughs> they're lying. It's, I mean, it's – uh, I mean, it's pretty easy to hit the wrong Whenever button. Whenever you're doing whoops. percentages, there's a big difference between the plus and the minus. <laughs> <laughs> Water does not run up. Not that I would know. No. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, then if people walk between your laser and decide to have a conversation, that'll screw you up, too. That's mm. the one disadvantage. You guys run GPS. Yeah, so we had a problem. Um, for some reason, we lost GPS. And we, have, we have one run. I know it's only like 150 feet, but it's worthless. It ain't doing anything. Right. And... Um, which that's the that's nice where that second receiver comes in because it gives you an automatic safeguard. Um, which if your GPS is working right too, it does kind of too. But I mean, I I just like having that visual of knowing. Yeah. So that GPS, it's all run off a satellite. Yes, we're running RTK, so we're not really using a satellite. We're using a cell signal correction. Mm -hmm. but and it uh, can gauge depths to a yes. Wow. Well, it gauges location. Yeah, you you have a fixed point on the tractor, and it's using like. It's taking measurements off your right. three point. So whenever BJ was backing up, he would he would. Uh, so he's surveying, and when he's surveying, okay, surveying the he, when he's surveying the plow is at a certain depth, and it's basically taking the measurement from the tip of that plow to the ground, and that's okay. how it's getting its survey. So one major difference from the way they do it, the way we do it, 
is whenever BJ comes down through there, he does what they call a survey. So that survey will show them a contour line on their screen. And then they go in there and type in their parameters. I want to be this deep. I want to be at least this percentage. And I want to have my minimum. I never want to come this close to the surface. Right. So he backs in a star hole. He hits go and takes off. So if you don't hit go, you also fuck up. (laughs) (laughs) So what we do is, is we put our main line in. We put our plow down in there. And then I got to hop in a Ranger or a buggy and I'll drive out there to our end point. And I got to figure out what my slope and percentage is. And I got to do all that manually. Yeah. I go back to my laser. I type that in and then I take off and go. And if I got a big rolling hump or a hill, like his will automatically survey that and put that in. So I may have to say I got a thousand foot run. I may have to run a thousand feet, stop, reset, and then change my percentage and go again. And hope you're right when you do the second half. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be kind of so, important. You know, he, he's got a huge time savings there on me because if he runs one out with it being a non-toe uh, behind, he can survey in reverse, right? Yep. So when he goes out, he has to back up to the main line again. So he's surveying. So he's kind of killing two birds with one stone. Right, yeah. Where I got to get out each time and figure out. Well, notice that that's out. something you talked about, the three-point versus the toe behind. Yeah. They can't survey backing. I up. mean, I assume you could survey in reverse, but, I mean, you're... You're backing a trailer for thousands of well, feet. Well, I, yeah. I was going to yeah. say that. Was Ben, he's got a toe behind, doesn't he? Yes. I thought I was yeah. going to give him a hard Talk time about... about farmer ben. Yeah. Yeah, he's I was, was going to give him a hard time about not being able to back up a trailer, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how hard is it? <laughs> so one big advantage you have over us, though, is traction. I mean, we're running yeah. tires, and you're running a... A yeah, sixty thousand pound bulldozer. Yeah, and I think it depends on the situation though, because you guys got pizza cutter tires, which is like the ideal thing for. That's what they claim. But man, I have a hard time. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I, that's Soil Max. That's what they said. This is the ideal setup with an, a CVT transmission. Go any speed you want, and with these little yeah. 10 tires. So, and uh, I, I know I got an advantage on you on slimy conditions. There's no doubt about that. Actually, that's whenever I get my best tractions when it's a little bit slimy outside. We can walk right through. What actually hurts me is when it starts drying out because I've got a wide pad, so I start losing ground pressure. So is yours an LGP dozer? Uh, it's it's not true LGP, but they call it a wide track. I run 34-inch 30, 30, uh, pads. Okay. Um, but uh, whenever the top's dry and it's wet down this a little you bit farther. You just have powder on top of it. Yeah, and I just, I just keep clawing that off, and i I got to almost spin the track a full revolution until I get down to something good. And that's why we don't pre-rip because if you pre-rip and bust that up, you've lost all your traction. I'm better off just going. One time this year, I've hit something I couldn't plow through. Pull a plow out of the ground, dig it up, figure out what it is. You got a new start hole anyways, and take off and go again. I'd, especially with fuel the way it is, um, we do no pre-ripping. Okay. We, we just go, and if we hit it, we hit it. Um, of course, I got two 850 dozers, so if I need muscle to get it through, I can get it through usually. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's one thing people misunderstand with tile plowing, that you need – Horsepower. Oh, you, you horsepower. Need weight. Horsepower is useless. You need weight. Yeah, you need weight. You can pull that thing through the ground with a twenty-three horse Kubota if you wanted to. Yeah, that might be a little rough on it. That, <laughs> that might be an exaggeration. Depends on how. Depends That's on a how YouTube fast. video. Hey, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, don't put it on your Kubota. Depends on how fast you want to go. But horsepower, horsepower is not the issue. It's weight. Yeah, and weight equals equals traction. That's well, what like a big to. plow machine. I mean, I don't think they have more than three hundred horsepower, but they weigh. 80 to 100,000 pounds. So what, uh, do you know what your accuracy is on your GPS? Like what percent or what do you mean? Like are you plus or minus an inch? Plus oh, it's minus? supposed to be sub-inch. Sub-inch. Yep. So see, I, see we're, I think we're uh, three-eighths is where we're at. So that's one thing you'll usually find with the laser is they're a little bit more accurate than uh, what GPS will be. But, I mean, we're talking stacking pennies here. I don't know if it's really enough to. Well, I mean, that GPS is based off a tractor like you know, on the three point is based off the tractor tires making contact with the ground, right? right. It runs over a little bit of a hump. It, well, it's it's it actually affected or, no, because it's all well, the globe on the top, and the globe is directly a check, uh, attached to the boot or the knife or the whatever they want to call it on the soil. Max, we call it the boot on ours, but uh, so whatever the tractor does, don't affect it a whole lot because it's it's what it's, it's all about what that boot does, the movement of so that. So with the, actually with the three point. Um, like a tr- I remember one time we were going through a, a slight ditch. Like mm-hmm. we just plowed right through it. And one of the guys from Soil Max was here this year, and he kind of made the comment that that ditch, with a, with the three-point being so close to the tractor, you're going to see that more on your graph than you would like a tow behind. Right. And well, we have the same problem with being a tract-type machine, that uh, if we go through a little ditch or a swell, it's, it's a lot harder for us to hold grade because that it, it kind of articulates and pivots. Yep. Uh, now, you're... A soil max plow, they control depth off 
pitch of the bit. Yep. So if you want to come up, you pitch it back. If you want to go down, you pitch it forward. Okay. Um, I'm controlling depth with a little bit of vertical movement, but my ripper, the way it's set up, mostly because the pins are wore, it also changes pitch slightly. So if I make a big jump, it'll actually kind of hunker down a little bit. It uh, A lot of the big tile plow guys were really worried about the way I was controlling depth, but, man, if they want to come out and dig it up premium I'm wrong, they're more welcome to. It's, it's, it does a phenomenal job. But, Speak, speaking of needing to pre-rip. But, um, but I can change depth a lot faster than he can. Okay. Well, yeah, I noticed on yours, it just has, it has two cylinders that just control depth, right? It actually no, slides so the, within the... The two cylinders, that's where I get my extra... T- so my ripper has four foot of travel. Okay. And it's and all the way down to foot off the ground, I want to plow five feet, right? So I got to lower that boot down two feet. And then once it's down and locked in, they don't move. So you don't use that to control your depth? Then? No, we okay. use the actual ripper movement. So whenever that ripper goes up, it tilts in. Okay. Whenever it goes... Down it tilts out, which is a little bit counterintuitive what you think you would need, but it works, and I ain't arguing with it. Okay, <laughs> it's. Uh, I'm impressed that you made one and it works that well. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let me tell you, it was a huge relief whenever I seen that first piece of tile go through that thing into the ground. Because at that point, what do you do, uh, Brian? <laughs> you got tile plowing, bro, bud. <laughs> tractor. Yeah, tractor. Would that have yeah. worked on your dozer? Uh, no, I, I, I almost bought the exact same plow he's got and welded a three point hitch on my ripper. Um, yeah, I come real close to doing that. And the guy kind of, actually, I probably would have done that if a guy didn't back out on me last minute. Cause, uh, he had the, uh, what is their, uh, it's an, is a act leader system. Of so what's the, uh, um, GPS? you're talking about their software system, yeah. um, in Teleslope. Uh, it's a different Teledrain, I think, or something. Uh, okay. it, it's a it's a partnership with Ag Leader. Yeah, Ag Leader owns Swellmax. Okay. So yeah. Ag Leader is a GPS company. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Uh, but the guy backed out. It, it was supposed to come with the, the GPS setup, and the guy backed out. He was going to keep the GPS and just sell the plow. And I was like, man, I, it kind of got into the numbers game. Because yeah, uh, I want to say that, that module was like ten grand. Yeah, it's almost the uh, – it's not almost the cost of the plow, but it's a significant yeah. part of it. So it's, you could buy it, the GPS system and put it on your plow? Yeah, actually, I talked to the guys at the farm show about possibly putting it on my plow. But, uh, with, I mean, it's minimal. So it's minimal when I say this. But I got better accuracy doing what I'm doing with lasers. The problem is I just got the setup. I'm constantly moving so and surveying myself. You would just have it be faster, though. The advantage of the GPS. If everything's working, probably. Okay. Uh, but then also... But, but faster don't mean better job. And okay. Whenever you're talking faster, so, you know, on a good day, uh, I think some of our longest runs were, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 feet on laterals. Um, we were putting seven to 10,000 feet in the ground a day, so uh, I think you put some 3,000-foot runs in, didn't you, in four-inch? Uh, I, just, I was thinking they were 1,800 to 2,000. Okay, so we're about there in the same ball game. But I want to say, like, a roll of tile would last... Uh, Two and a half runs. So that'd be about two thousand feet a piece. Okay, so I mean, if we can average seven to ten thousand feet a day, and I've only got a two man crew, and also I, mean, I don't know how much faster I can get because at that point, if something goes wrong, you have to call a rep probably. Yeah, I mean that's pretty technical stuff. Isn't yeah, it? I, yeah, it's there's not a lot to go wrong though. I okay, mean, there, yeah. not there something some, you can't fix over a phone call. You mean if if. For the most part, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and and to that point, I mean, I got stuff that can go wrong on mine too, and I've and whether it's GPS or, or laser, I still got the old manual backup. I could probably go to, but okay. I don't know. I'm not saying I'll never go to GPS, um, but I'm pretty happy with what I got right now for no more than what we do. Uh, and it also depends on what you know the workload looks like next spring too. So, yeah, or this fall. Yeah. Um, like you talked about needing to pre-rip, but then messing up with messing your traction where you don't have as good traction. Um, would it work? And this is just a random idea I had. If you had like a a two chisel plow, like where you have a, a what you'd have a front chisel that kind of just breaks it up, even though it'd be behind a dozer, so that the main chisel doesn't have to break up as much dirt. I don't think I, so. Maybe a little bit, but I don't think it's worth the extra drag on the machine because the way those tile plows work, they pierce the ground and they lift it. Right. <coughs> so even if you pre-rip the top, all the pressures, by the, time, by the time the plow comes through and gets to that pre-rip part, it's already lifted it because the bit's so far up underneath. I okay. don't really know. 
Yeah, you would have to have the second bit out further, which would make right. it right. I, I bit think it's, control. it'd be such a minimal difference. I don't know if it's worth the. And then, then that would make steering like if you wanted to turn that thing and make it almost impossible. Well, that and when you're pre ripping, you're doing it so you can pull through easier. And if you're got two shanks in the ground at the same time, you're not going to pull any easier. Don't yeah. you pull harder? Yeah. Right. You have two shanks, but each shank is doing. I don't know. A lot of guys are huge fans of pre-ripping, and we tried to experiment with it a few times, and just found it to be an absolute waste of time, money, and fuel. It was we were better off. We were better time spent to to take our chances, put the plow ground, put pipe in, and go. If we hit a problem, you cut the tile off, you pull the plow out of the ground, you fix it, and you put it back in the ground and go again. Okay. And traction, and, and, and to Brian's point, traction was rarely ever our problem as far as pulling. Um. Uh, 100,000 plus feet, we maybe had to tow the tractor for 5,000 feet to that. Some of it was mud. Some of it was some really deep stuff. But um, I don't know. We just we kind of realized it, was, it wasn't time effective to do it, so we just kind of go. And the other thing is, especially with tracks, and tires are kind of similar. You go down through there and you bust up that top layer. You come back through, I swear you have half the traction. I don't hmm. know what it is about it, but you, you lose a percentage of your traction. So... Did you really gain anything by uh, having less drag whenever you got less traction? It's kind uh, of a give and take. Yeah. Are there uh, tractor tires <coughs> wider, further apart than your tracks? Further yeah, away I, from the where, where you would be pre-ripping? Uh, the tires, yeah, they're, uh, yeah, you guys set out quite a bit wider than what I do. We're 120 inch. I mean, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm outside to outside, I'm probably about 112, so not a whole lot, I guess. I noticed that your your tile plow was paint like everything was color matched. Did you paint the dozer and everything? No, so the uh, dozer I got the 850J you're referencing is actually military surplus. It looks <clears> cool. It's I like a, it. It's a 2011 model, but it only had 900 hours on when I bought it. Wow. And um, uh, a good buddy of mine, Clint CNC Equipment, gets a lot of those in, and um, that's actually the second one I got. So whenever I built the plow, uh, I just got a hold of him and said, hey, man, I want to make this thing m- match. I'm, I'm not, like, a really freakish about everything being pristine. But you got to paint it anyways. Yeah, you got to paint it anyways. So you might as well paint it up to match. Good. So um, that's how that all that's how that all come to be. And, uh, yeah, it uh, – one thing about it, it's something that's it different, and that's good for YouTube visually. Right. That's the other thing is, is you know, there's a lot of people on YouTube who got an 850J dozer, but I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only one that's got a green one. You got a yeah. Mad Max. I'm pretty dozer. sure I'm the only one that's got a random tile plow and a ripper on the back. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you got to stand out just a little bit. So, uh, other than the price being right and the buddy having one to sell me, that was the main reason. But I mean, I didn't have it custom painted that color. It's the okay. color I bought it. So. So on your equipment lineup, what what is your lineup that are at the current moment? I mean, you've got a little bit of everything as far as brands, correct? Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not brand loyal to anything. Um, it's kind of whatever I'm comfortable with that fits the build that's been reliable. I mean, if it's a good piece of equipment, I like operating. It don't give me a lot of trouble to stick around. If I don't like operating, it gives me gives me trouble. Uh, it goes down the road. I have to go back and look, but. Uh, uh, I guess I'm technically a one man operation. I do have a few guys that help me part time. I don't want to discredit them at all. We got we got about 18 pieces of equipment, well over 20 if you count the trucks and trailers. Uh, but what that allows me to do is, uh, especially in busy season, is I can be on one job. I can have one of my part time guys leapfrogging all the equipment to the next job and just keep going where I'm never never quitting. But I uh, got three different excavators. You got uh, a Volvo 140, John Deere 120, and a little Cat 304. Uh, currently got a Hyundai, brand new Hyundai uh, 210, looking to upgrade to a little bigger excavator on the demo right now. And uh, so, what what would that replace? That I don't know for sure, but it's probably going to replace the 140, the Volvo 140. Um, the, the the the. So you looking to sell that 140? Yeah. Yep, it's kicking on down the road. Smell a business deal coming <laughs> on. Full <laughs> top. So. Um, the the I'm not sentimental to a whole lot of equipment, but the 120 has been. Uh, I've heard you talk pretty highly of that. Yeah, it's it's been a, a great, great, awesome. That's the older machine, deer machine, right? Older deer machine. It's been a good, reliable machine to this day. It's still a good, reliable machine, and uh, I don't know, man. It's one of the first big purchases I made. It's literally dug me out of some holes, literally and financially. <laughs> uh, so I just feel like I owe it to that machine to live out a good life because it's it's been so good to me over the years. So and I, I mean, we still use it daily. I mean, it's still in full rotation. It's not like it's put up on a shelf somewhere in retirement. It's still 
still earning its keep. So, uh, yeah, got the got the three excavators um, run three different dozers. We got an 850B, which is an older 850 dozer. Is that the open station? Yep. Okay. Um, just a really good old solid machine. It's slow, but it's full, fuel efficient. But uh, for some of the smaller big jobs, it's perfect. You know, you can haul it in, get your stuff done, get out. Got a little D4 uh, open station machine. Looking to possibly uh, upgrade that to something a little newer. It's got about $10,000 on it. It's been an excellent dozer, but it's uh, – it's to the point where I need to invest some money into it or, or move on from it. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. I may invest the money into it and still get something, but I'd like to upgrade that one. And then uh, I got an 850J uh, dozer. It's the one we were talking about with the tile plow on it. That's been a nice addition to the fleet. I mean, from there, it's rollers, compactors. We've got a Kubota skid steer that's uh, going to find a new home at some point as well. Me and the Kubota <laughs> don't get along very well. Um, I know a lot of people speak highly of Kubota. I've yet to run one that I was happy with, like any Kubota. I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to go back to what my mom told me. If you don't have nothing nice, say, don't say <laughs> nothing at all. Um, I've had a few different Kubota pieces of equipment over the years, and I keep thinking, well, it's just that one. <laughs> yeah. And then I get another right. one, and I'm like, well, it's this one too. And I get another one, and I'm like, really? Three in a row? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just got three bad ones. Yeah. That, I, which they're more geared toward the hobby. Not anymore. Oh, I mean, oh, really? If you, want, if you want to start off fight on YouTube? That's what you tell them. It's hobby equipment. Oh, oh boy, we're gonna go. I mean, right guys, it's no different than like they're definitely geared more towards. They're trying commercialized. To. They're they're working on it yeah. with yeah. their with their uh, their excavators and their skid steers are geared more towards it. The the tractors and TLBs, tractor loader backhoes. They're I don't know, man. I it's not like operating it is not bad. It's balanced, halfway decent. It's like whenever something breaks on it and you see how, I don't even know what the word is. Flimsy what, it's built? No, just the, the stupidity in engineering. Oh. Hard to work on. Okay. Yeah, it's like. Oh, yeah. I think my famous line in the last repair video is, is I'm a dumb hill jack from Indiana and I know better than that. So yeah. what's the, it's, I don't know, just, just really just irritates me like to no end. Yeah. So, but the problem is, I don't know, I haven't found anything better. So maybe I should just. You shut up. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, got several uh, small tractors. I mean, I lose track of what I got, to be honest with you. But um, we are, all your, that are your main pieces, your dozers and excavators? Yeah, in? that's the that's yeah. the bread and butter of everything. Gotcha. Uh, just bought a Volvo haul truck, articulated haul truck. Got it in that's what I was going to ask. That's the one you hold <clears> that to the logger fellow with. Yep, yep. Haul truck, that's what they call it's, that thing. It's got brakes and lockers on it now. We're in good shape. Oh, so. <laughs> oh you're, not, you're not talking about the off-road truck. So I got I got the one of the trucks I'm building is what we call Lieutenant Dan, which is the big Paystar International six wheel drive truck. It's not done yet, but the one you're talking about is what we call Bubba Dump, which is yeah. a which is a thirty ton articulated haul. Wait truck. a minute, you got Lieutenant Dan and Bubba Dump? Yeah. Oh man. So there's <laughs> a little where bit you of got a, those names. There's a little bit of a story behind this. So the um, the what's Lieutenant Dan now used to be an ex Navy truck, so it has the military lieutenant connection. And Dan's actually my late dad's name. Oh. So that's where we put the two together to make Lieutenant Dan. Now, Bubba Dump, that was a <laughs> drunken wife one. <laughs> There's no meaning behind that one other than she came up with it one day, thought it was funny about Peter Pan. So, oh, <laughs> so is, that, is that the truck you got at the auction? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Bubba Dump's the one we got at the auction gotcha. down in Florida. So We've got one very We've got a 25-ton. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, I didn't even know you that. had one. Yeah, whenever I bought the farm where the grain bins are, there was just so much concrete and trees that we were moving out. Yeah, mine's uh, about 10 years newer and one size bigger, but it's yeah. pretty much the same truck. Yep. Yeah, good solid old truck, so. Hmm. <coughs> Yours has brakes, so I'm kind of jealous. They don't come with brakes? No, they do. Just after a few oh. thousand hours, you're probably supposed to do some stuff to them. And, uh, supposed to, yeah. yeah. If I yeah. remember right, isn't there just one big brake on the drive shaft or something? That's the parking brake. That's, 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 that's what, whenever everything else fails, that's what you use. So that's the, that's ours is hanging up, I think, is what our problem is. <laughs> she doesn't like to unpark. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's better than not parking at all. Yeah, I guess so, it. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, but they're actually, uh, the brake system's all going to, it's actually pretty simple. It's uh, I'm assuming yours is the same as mine. It's uh, air over hydraulic. They got yep. air chambers on the master cylinders and calipers, and you keep fluid in them and don't do anything too crazy. Yeah, I mean for that truck, um, for what we paid, I mean we paid very. It was very cheap. It was sight unseen purchase, and I mean we really can't complain well, too yeah, much. And for no more than you guys. You yeah, I mean we've perfect. maybe put a couple hundred hours yeah. on it. We've had it for almost ten years. Yeah, worth every penny. Yep. 
Yep. Yeah, it's one of the things where it was like, do we really need that? And no. Every time we use it, I'm really glad we have it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, we do such a variety of work, you know, in the springtime from about March till mid-June. It's, it's all focused on the farmers, you know. We do a lot of work for many different farmers, getting those guys planted. So you get out of mid-June, and you start getting into your lakes and your ponds and your septic systems, and you're more generic, you know, site builds. You're more generic excavating, and that will usually carry you through, you know, Thanksgiving up into Christmas. You're finishing off some new stuff. And then from, I don't know, mid-December, 1st of January through March again, you know, I kind of try to chill out. I wouldn't call it the off-season, but that's when we do a lot of our maintenance and get stuff in the shop. and work Get more on, of a 9 to 5. Yeah, I kind of work on the projects, and that's whenever, you know, a lot of the shows are at. I try to do some of my traveling, you know. Uh, you going to Con Expo? Yes, sir. Kind of thinking about it. Need to come on out there. Kind of thinking about it. I think, it. Um, I can't say, I'll tell you later, but there's some stuff in the works that you'll probably be interested in if, okay. it, if it all comes through. So, Trying to talk uh, Zach and Randy into going. Coming out there, yeah. yeah. And I think Zach is racing in the desert in some kind of Baja car that week. Really? Yep, so it might work out we all three go. But. I wonder how many, uh, oh, you know, you're talking about dirt perfect build a tile plow. I'm sure that poor guy's Instagram was blown up with pictures of my stupid <laughs> tile plow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I got so many messages that I need to get a hold of Randy. Or, oh, or anytime I, I, I do anything with Randy, tile. Yeah, it's like. I'm like, you guys do realize that there are more people that put in tile than just Randy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you do realize that, like, even though we're friends, Randy is a busy guy. Like, I can't be calling him every time we got we got a question here. So, yep. He does know his tile, though, but it's oh, yeah. completely different. Like, some of the stuff they do with tile, I'm like, I just didn't even know that was possible. Yeah. Well, that, and you get a good point you bring up there because. Everywhere in the country, they do it a little bit different. Oh, yeah. And a lot of that, it comes down, they found out what worked for them. So, that's not what we do in Minnesota. Well, last I checked, I'm installing in Indiana. So, I think I'm going to be all right, you know. Like, we're going to pull this off. Just stick with us. We're going to get this. I promise. <laughs> yep. So, with um, equipment, like, how, how you liking the Hyundai? I mean, you seem pretty. I'll tell you what. Um, I have... Every this is the third one I have. Uh, people that don't watch the channel know I got a relationship with Hyundai. Um, people also who watch the channel don't matter who I got a relationship with. I'm going to be honest about it, and that's one thing I love about Hyundai. They're like, we don't care what you say, tell the world. Uh, they don't put any restrictions on me. They don't coach me. They drop all the pieces of the equipment and say, have at it. They don't pre-screen any of my videos. So that's uh, so with Underfirth, they have a similar relationship, and that's how they've always been. Yeah, just, and just uh, use it like you own it. Yeah, use it like you own it and be honest with it. Now, I mean, obviously we're respectful and we think there's an issue or a concern, they're the first phone call. I don't go blasting it all over the internet. but This thing's a piece of shit. Yeah, but if you guys watch my videos, I mean, they're all straight up tailor stuff I don't like about them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, back to that, uh, one thing I love about Hyundai is is the corporate people there. Like, they are just unbelievable. Like, honestly, there's been suggestions. Like, I think this needs to be changed for certain applications. And they're not like, oh, that's nice, you know, and blow you off. They're like, let's figure it out, Mike. Talk to the engineer. Let's do this. Let's see what needs to be done. They're all about it. So, I don't know. I just, uh, in in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm part of the team over there. You know, it's, it's really cool, and they trust me enough. Like, we got uh, the 85 we had last year. First one in the country, come to Derby, and we we did some testing and tuning on it, did some videos on it. Uh, the machine I got right now is the first one in the country with machine guidance on it. It's a brand new factory system, so we've been working on it. Um, but long way around to answer your question, uh, I'm really liking it. I'm liking it to the point that uh, I've asked for a price on it. Yeah. So, I mean, as some people that watch our YouTube know, we were kind of looking at mini excavators, something in that 8 to 10 ton range, and... I mean, after watching several of your videos, I was kind of looking at them, but unfortunately there's just not a lot of used ones yeah. in, in our price range. Yeah. They look like a pretty solid machine the way they they're are. laid out. They are. Their mini excavators are, are awesome. And it's so – I got certain operating habits and characteristics, and I think that lends me to liking certain machines. And, and the Hyundai's just got that feel for me. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of back to the yellow and red. Yeah. It may be the right one for me. It may not be the right one for you, but I'm I'm very, very, very confident in the reliability of the machine and that it's going to do what I need to for a long period of time. I like the feel of the machine. Um, and I'm to the point now with the type of work I do, I need a bigger machine. I've outgrown my two smaller machines, so I, I got to do something. Um, and, uh, man, I can't thank those guys enough for letting me demo this equipment and do what I do. So hopefully we can get one bought and have one on the channel permanently. We'll have to see what happens. So when you go get a 30 tutter. <laughs> go bigger, go home. Come on. Now, Brian, bigger is not always better. <laughs> 
What are you going to get a 96 row planner? <laughs> well, let's try to see what we can come up with here. <laughs> this may be a dumb question, but is Hyundai the same one as makes the cars? So, here, not a dumb question, and it's really unique, is Hyundai is like one of the largest companies in the world, and you know what their biggest business is? They build oh. ships. They're the largest oh, ship. They're wow. the largest ship builder in the world. And I don't know the exact corporate structure. I actually did a video with one of the corporate guys, and he covered this a little bit. But there is the big Hyundai corporate. Okay. And, yes, in that aspect, it's the same ones that build the, the, the cars and the ships and the, and the equipment. But by the time it trinkers down to the cars and the equipment, they're, like, completely separate okay. on, on, on a day-to-day level, I guess. So they do funnel back eventually, but as far as is the way they operate and the way they go back now – the only place you'll see that is Hyundai, in my opinion, by far has the best in-screen monitor you'll ever see. Okay. It, it's, it's awesome. Well, all that technology come out of their touchscreens in their cars. Oh. And I think that's why a lot of people can just get into them and go. Yeah. Is because it's very similar to what you see in your car. Um, Hyundai also uses a lot of their paint technology on their equipment. So stuff after about 2010, usually the paint seems to hold up a little bit better because it's more of an automotive paint. That's probably one of the few crossovers you'll kind of see, uh, but yeah, Hyundai man, they got their hands in a in a lot of stuff. But they when, they, when I started digging into uh, solar panels, there's Hyundai solar panels. Yep, yep, so and they make semi trailers and okay. Um, they're kind of the global version of Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. You know what I mean? Like where they kind of group different companies in and 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 do everything, but. Uh, from a corporate standpoint, what I really like about them is, is like uh, I deal with Hyundai North America, and they're based out of North Cross, Georgia. And um, corporate overseas, I mean, they they keep an eye on what they're doing, but but in some aspects, you're like, you guys know the industry over there better than us. You guys do your thing and and keep on. So a lot of decisions, I guess the best way to describe that is a lot of decisions can get made right here in the states about what's going on. A lot of the stuff I do with them. Uh, is is all those decisions are based down there, a lot of my relationships there. So it's, it's just quite a bit different than some other companies I work with, which I just, it, as huge as what that company is, it, in a lot of ways it feels like a family company working with them. It's hmm. just, it's. That's cool that they got it structured like that. It blows my mind. I don't yeah. know how they do it, but it's, um, I've never met any, I'm, I've got to know a lot of people, like a lot of people at the corporate level there, and they're just all good old farm boys, good old hardworking people. They're hmm. awesome, awesome. They've been good to me, and I and I, I just don't say it because they're good to me. I mean, I have been impressed with their equipment. So, so they just make. Um, they have much other than excavators. Do they have? A yeah, full so line of construction? they're right now their bread and butter is excavators and loaders. That's okay. what they're really good for. They've actually uh, bought into Deucin, okay. and they're getting ready to bring on dozers and haul trucks and uh, possibly a skid steer. Um, now that's all going to be the skid steer and all that stuff's going to be focused towards rental yards. So the dozer is going to be yeah. a really an expensive option for rental yards, and so will the so will the skid steer. Probably like a twenty thousand pound machine or something. Uh, no, it'll be like a twelve thousand pound machine. It'll be under seventy four horse, so it don't have DEF. Ah, gotcha. it, it just have DPF on it. Um, but yeah, they're they're continually adding stuff uh, and partnering with people. But uh, excavators and loaders that's their two main two main things. Gotcha. Okay. Two main things for sure. But, yeah, man, it's uh, – yeah, but I guess circle all the way back to your main question, you know, the excavators and the dozers, that's that's where we do the majority of our work. Yeah. Which um, – like, which which one do you like to run the most, I guess, like bulldozer or excavator? I mean, I know it probably depends on the job and whatnot. But yeah, like, I'd say if you're going to make me pick one or the other, it would probably be a dozer. Okay. I know people ask me, you like planner or you like combine? I'm like, I yeah. hate this question because I like doing both of them. But Yeah, I I don't like doing anything for – I don't uh, – I like to change the scenery. So, I mean, if, I don't think I could ever be a dozer operator where I sit in there one for eight hours a day for years on end. Uh, but if I had to choose one or the other, it'd probably be a, a dozer. I feel like with a dozer, you're more on the move. Where with an excavator, you're sitting there spinning circles a lot of the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, but like he's talking, like when we – push trees out and stuff it's like well i can do this all in a day it's gonna take eight hours and i'm gonna sit right here and do just yeah, go back and forth but. yeah and with uh with a dozer 
especially if you're just gouging dirt, there's a lot less thinking involved. Yeah. <laughs> a lot less concentration, so you can kind of check your text message and maybe answer a few YouTube comments. So it's, when you're on an excavator, you can't really do that. you got to be pretty focused on. Uh, it's one thing doing. I realized real quickly, video and when doing excavating or bulldozing, either one, you really need some camera mounts because. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. Especially excavating. You're not exactly just using one hand. No, no. It's, uh, uh, yeah, we kind of perfected that a little bit, but uh, we don't have auto steer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't click a button and drive for a mile, you know. It's, that ain't no good. It's hard to check TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's all relative, I guess. Yep. So. Well, Road, do you have anything else? I was wanting to ask you about those big tiles you're using. Are oh, the clay? big clay tiles? Yeah, so uh, there was a company local there called King Clay. I believe it started in the late 1800s. Okay. And they produced tile all the way up until 2012, I believe. So they're not making them anymore. No, they. it's a, it's a long story. I actually got a video about it on my channel. Actually, I got a tour of the old factory on my channel if somebody wants to go back and search it. But um, they had like a 40-acre lot there in town that was just overstocked. So basically what they had, let's just say you order – uh, you order 10,000 feet of 36 inch. Well, they naturally overrun that because they assume you're going to break some or something's going to happen and, and they want them to all be the same. So you do that for 100 plus years, you start to end up with quite a collection of different tile and stuff. So the city ended up taking over the property after it got condemned and basically they got to the point where they were giving these things away because if they didn't, they had to they had to pay to dispose of them. Right. So. Yeah, I hauled like 42 semi-loads out of there. <laughs> I thought you were at a tile yard. I'm like, man, there's a lot of tiles sitting there, but yeah, that's just it's surplus. The yeah, yeah wow. it's the factory. So, um, you know, uh, the family has a 500-acre farm that uh, I live on, and I, I, own five ac- I own five acres, and the family's got 500 acres there. And I just bought a 160-acre farm personally, and um, there was a couple big ravines and stuff down through there. Um, I figured I'll never be able to afford to do it any other way. So let's get the tile and close some stuff up, make a few small fields, one big field. And yeah. I was just impressed with how heavy them suckers. You couldn't lift two with a loader. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, those, what in th- the those world? Those 36 inches that are eight foot long weigh about 5,000 pounds. Wow. <laughs> I'd have never thought that. Yeah. they're I uh, Actually, uh, whenever we leave here, I got a piece of one in the back of my truck. Take a look at it in person. It's, okay. It's a hell of a lot bigger than you think it is. I guess. It's, it's pretty crazy, but, yeah, you know, it's a shame. You know, my whole life, you needed a clay pipe. You just went under and got them, and they yeah. had mountains of them, and now it's weird no one. It, it sucks when a legendary company like that goes yeah, like, and, and, of course, I got probably the largest private stockpile of them now, so I got everybody and their brother <laughs> calling me and want to buy a pipe from me. I'm like, I kind of got it. I'm kind of hoarding yeah. it for myself, people, you know. It's, you hold it long enough, it might be worth a lot. Well, I don't eBay. eBay. <laughs> Ship, shipping might be a little yeah, expensive. That's going to be a killer. But, you know, a lot of people – a lot of people think that pipe's junk and it's fragile. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't realize is it is it will stand up to like chemicals and acids and urine and, and a lot of different things versus like concrete. It don't deteriorate. And compressive strength wise, uh, it's like nine times better than any other t- pipe made out there. Okay. Uh, so you can't point load it. You can't just like drop it and hit it. But if you get it encased, it's like nine times stronger. And what they were doing with it in the end. A uh, can clay down there. They actually put these. You know, the oh, everybody always thinks of the bell ends has a big bell end, one slides in the other. Well, they developed this method where they put these big thirty-six inch pipes up on a lathe, and they cut a quarter inch groove in it, and they cut another groove in it, and an O ring would go in. They put quarter inch steel bands that fit in that groove. So they call it jacking pipe. So I know we're on a podcast, but to kind of visualize this, <clears throat> they drop it down in the hole. They take a big hydraulic press and they push it into the ground. Uh-huh. They'd come back and they'd drop their pipe in and their band and push it in the ground. They're pushing this pipe like a mile to the next oh, manhole. Oh, wow. And they'd auger out the inside of it and go, and no other pipe would, would, would stand up to the stress of, no of pushing that in there. Uh, doing a lot of that all around Atlanta and up in Georgia. So, uh, Logan Clay, which I think somewhere here in Ohio. Uh, right, Logan, Ohio, maybe, I'm guessing. It's an hour away or something. Okay, it's in Logan, Ohio. But okay. a lot of that equipment is in that facility now. They're doing that. And they're, they're still running? They're still running. They okay. come down there and bought the extruders and all these lays and stuff, and they took them up to Logan Clay in Logan, Ohio. And now they're doing that same process to fulfill them contracts. So next time people ask for a pipe, just send them to Logan. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you only yeah. got about a five-hour drive. Yeah, five-hour drive around drip. So. But, yeah, it's a well, uh, lot, lot more to it. The video that I watched, you were putting them in for the logger. Yeah, and yeah, I was logger like, leg. I was impressed that you, you didn't seem like you had them in real deep to they could drive a log truck over Oh, it. yeah, I don't phase them at all. 
So it's better than like even a corrugated. Oh, yeah. You wow. Can't. Even if they're cracked, if all they're in the ground, they'll still hold up. Hmm. So we put them in that day. They hauled 72 semi loads of logs across there in the next couple of days, and they still look the same. Huh. Cool. It's pretty wild. One last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, we talked about it a little bit at the start of the podcast, or maybe we, we weren't even on air, is uh, the future of uh, excavating equipment. I always like to just try to see what people – I saw you stopped at that one, I don't know what kind of show it was, and you were yeah, running a VR. Uh, yeah, the uh, – oh, uh, that was at the World of Asphalt. Uh, Volvo actually had the VR uh, equipment headset down there. So. Yeah, and it just – you know, I've seen uh, driverless tractors just, you know, demo or what do you call them, beta – yeah. tractors i guess yeah. but if i've wondered you think that they will come whenever you can program a tractor or a, a piece of equipment that you need this this dirt move there and it right. will do it so all computerized without without you having to make each move it'll do it itself yes and no so in the farming world and brian jump in here because i'm not a farmer i want to preference that but in the farming world you set a boundary and then you get ib lines and you basically go back and forth right i know there's more to it than that but that's the basics of it in the equipment world, it's not that simple. Uh, the most common scenario I can think of is, is like a rock quarry. So you're picking up this pile over here, you're dumping in this truck over here, and there's a lot of other moving parts within your boundary. You know, right. There's other things in there. I think the next big step for the equipment industry is an operator is probably going to operate from the lazy boy in his living room. Right. Like There's still going to be human inputs into that machine, but they're going to be from a remote location. Versus Could be at your, ho- at your home. Home or yeah. what I foresee happening is it still being on site, but they're just going to have a big office building set up with 15 operating stations. Cubicles or something. And, 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 the, and the first to go with this is going to be for safety reasons. You're going to operate from here. Over, over time, once they understand that, hey, we can operate from a remote location, and then they're going to let you start. You may, may be doing it from home or different places like that. Um, so loaders, excavators, anything that requires multiple motions with a little bit of skill or, or human input involved, I think that's the way they're going to go. Other things like haul trucks and stuff, I think they'll be able to put them on a guidance path and turn them loose well, and let them do their thing. The thing that I think about, though, on that is, like, if you look at the driverless cars they have nowadays, a lot of what they go by is they have eyes. Right. Like, they see other cars, computerized, of course, but they'd have to almost incorporate that into seeing a, seeing a pile of rocks. Seeing how when you scoop it, you know how full the bucket is. Uh, I think um, the I think the fight's going to be, <clears throat> you know, kind of like uh, my point with Brian and an AB line. A car's got a road to follow, right? You know, and it, you can build a virtual road and on a job site, but there's still, <coughs> excuse me, there's still a lot more variables. Yeah, <coughs> I agree that what you're talking about that uh, the the operators will be remotely. I think that will become first, but I just wonder if eventually. You'll program it to, I don't know. We'll see. That'll be way down the road, but yeah, I was just curious what your you know, thoughts on that. The Jeffersons thought we'd have flying cars by 2020. We didn't make Well, that there's already work. things, though, oh, on no. excavators where you set a depth and it'll dig that depth, right? So that's what they call MC, which is machine control. <clears throat> so, so, I mean, stuff like that already exists, oh. but you're still sitting in the cab. And right. You're still oh, running yeah. sticks. You, yeah, you're, you're still doing all the inputs. It's just stopping you whenever you get out of bounds is basically the best way I know to describe it, uh, which would be the same thing as like a GPS-operated dozer and stuff, but... Um, the, I don't know why, but the construction industry seems to be about 10 years behind the farming industry when it comes to technology and our machines. Um, well, I think one of us probably, I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but most farms are still op- operated by the owner. Yeah, I might be. Might the, be. There just seems like there's a lot more variety of people. You know, like, like you guys run ISO Best Connections a lot, which is like one generic connection a bunch across a whole bunch of different manufacturers and implements. Like you buy a cat... Skid steer attachment. Yeah, yeah, it'll have its own plug, and you can't use it on any other piece so, of equipment. So when we like, start when we start looking at those uh, minis, like I didn't realize how many different quick attach. Yeah, buckets I was like, were. I just want to go smack somebody. I'm like, where is <laughs> common sense at in this, people? And, yeah. and you guys have got that figured out, you know. Um, I, I say you guys, the, the farmers. Well, you know? certain companies do, but certain companies don't work well with others, namely ones that are green. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they'll work with those is. companies, but you have to pay that green company a lot of money right, to do it. Right, right. Huh. I uh, think that's going to bite the green company in the butt one of these days, not playing well with others. I don't know. They have such a – I mean, John Deere is such a loyal fan base. I, I, I don't know. I, I would think – I mean, it's very frustrating to a lot of people. Yeah, but this um, this newer generation coming up, I think that loyalty starts going out the window a little bit when it comes uh, to – I don't know. When you poll someone and think, what does the American farmer look like, they're going to tell them with a John Deere tractor. I mean, that's just the middle yeah. image most people have. 
Yeah. Like no, marketing department at John Deere at one point was very, very good. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, I mean, and, and they do have good equipment, too. I mean, yeah, I mean, their equipment's not trash. It's just, it drives me, for, for example, we bought a used John Deere tractor uh, last winter, or two years ago. That's the articulated one? Yeah. So it was a 2012, I believe, uh, oh. 9410. That tractor, we wanted to run an ag leader steering system through because that's what we our corn planter runs on. All of our stuff runs through ag leader. That's what we wanted to run it on. Uh, bought all the stuff to put it in there. Our guy was putting our system in, and I'll be darned if we didn't need a $500 unlock yeah. from John Deere to run an aftermarket steering system in our John Deere tractor. Wow. And it's just yeah. crap. Like I called my salesman. And I was like, hey, man, put my toolbox on this on the front of this tractor. What's it, well, how much the unlock? <laughs> 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 yeah, but you guys are way more standardized than we are. Yeah, uh, which is which is aggravating. And as getting the the more aggravating part is our industry is getting worse. Like there's more and more new uh, adapters and hitches and plates and stuff developed every day. It's like at some, some point they're going to have to get their heads together, though. I mean, if yeah. if if two companies do, everybody else may have to follow. Suit. Well, I think it's may more work. than just two. Like there's yeah. just so many different companies, right? And there's so many different attachments. You know, companies. Cat makes an awesome grader attachment, and it's it's integrated into their system. So whenever you hook it up to their skid steer, it knows the grader is out there, and it changes the controls to match that grader. Yeah, I got a Kubota skid steer. I think it's useless to me. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing more than a boat anchor hanging around there on the front. Gotcha. And it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, there should. I mean, even if you got to buy a bridge or whatever they call it, there should be a way. All right. It needs to go back to like an ISO bus plug. There needs to be a way that they can cross communicate and do things. And yeah, it, it is what it is, I guess. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing I'm worried about is, is if you buy a 2022 skid steer and 2022 grader, and you like the grader, and you want to buy a 2025 skid steer one day, where are you going to have those two don't talk to each other anymore? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> uh, it's something uh, you need to get figured out. Yeah, figured what's out. your thoughts on electric in the excavation equipment? I noticed they had a couple of demos there at that. Yeah, so I, I I don't know I don't talk about a whole lot on my channel, but we do <clears throat> I do get on some large commercial job sites. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's got its place. Okay. Like there are certain situations where I can see it be useful. Indoors for one. Indoors, tight job sites. You know, some of these companies get green credits and stuff for everyday random stuff like what we do. I, I don't know if the price and the technology is there. Yeah. Like uh, Volvo, for example, they've got some really nice, like their little electric wheel loader impresses the hell out of me. Okay. Like uh, it is, it's electric drive, but then it, so whenever you're driving it, it don't affect the hydraulics of the boom and everything. I think they got a quick charge. You can charge it like in an hour. It's like at like seven hours run time. Like for a little landscaping yard or something, uh, I think it'd be pretty doggone slick. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the equipment industry has the same problem as everybody else. It comes into battery, battery technology is the limiting factor. Right. Is how, you know, how can we store this energy? That's the uh, same with cars. I mean, it's still relatively new, honestly. Right. I think it has to be more available. Like you were talking about that wheel loader and stuff for a landscaper. The landscaper hasn't been to his home base in two months, and he's just leaving his equipment from job site to job yeah. site. All of a sudden, that piece of equipment. Yeah, and that's one thing that, you know, you bring up a good point is that piece of equipment would not be hopping job sites. It'd be left at the yard to load trucks. Because, that's true. That's because the charger is the size of the piece of equipment. You know, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not something you usually throw in the back of a pickup truck. And, yeah. and it kind of defeats the purpose if you haul a generator around. <laughs> to charge yeah. your electric vehicle. Yeah. So... Uh, I'm just going to use Volvo for an example. They've really put some time and effort into this and got some really nice electric equipment. Uh, they got a little 25 E25 excavator in that loader. And uh, it's definitely proven to be very useful and reliable in certain situations, but it's it's not an across-the-board thing. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I still think that we're going to see some sort of some more hybrid stuff in these excavators. Okay. Uh, you know, an excavator is something pretty simple. You could put a little uh, generator you know, small motor in and, and run the hydraulics off electric. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of that. Um, I think that technology is going to start coming more into the uh, industry. Caterpillar has had an electric high-track dozer for years. Uh, it's the high-track D7E, I believe. And they do that. It's an electric drive motor that drives the tracks, and they got a small diesel engine that drives a generator. Um, and that's been very successful then for a long time. I don't know why more people don't know about that, but hmm. it, it's going to be intriguing to see where it goes for yeah. sure. It's, uh, 
the other flip side of that is I'm I'm a surprise from about 150 horse down we haven't went back to gas and some stuff. Oh really? Those gas engines are so much cheaper. They're a third of the price right now. Yeah. Um, tractors, excavators, some especially stuff like an excavator that has a constant RPM load. I mean, you can tune an engine to that. Yeah, like you're not really like, lugging an excavator. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I know a dozer or something. I don't know if it'd work, but like an excavator or, or stuff like that. Um, I think you, you know, you could knock. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say you can probably knock twenty five, thirty thousand dollars off the purchase price by going back to a gas engine. Yeah, I have. Yeah, and that's. I think part of that is just because of how new electric is. I mean, yeah, and, and the other thing is, you know, big companies are set up to haul the gas around, so right. now you, you you introduce another f- fuel in there, and there's yeah. there's more logistics involved than just changing the engine. So yeah, yeah. it's gonna be uh, interesting to see where we're at just ten years from now. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it'll be. Um, I think across the board, I think we'll see all sorts of changes here in the, yeah. in the future in all the industries. But um, yeah. fuel prices is a big concern now, and that may be a driving factor on how fast some of this stuff gets developed. Makes you wonder if it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> Put on my tinfoil hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, all right. Well, I think uh, I think that pretty much covers everything. We probably better let you get back on the road. I mean, if you leave now, you might make it home before midnight. Yeah, we got work tomorrow too. So, <laughs> oh man. Now you told people he's going to shout out his handles. Oh yeah, yeah. What's your uh, where can everybody find you on the socials? Okay, it's, uh, Instagram, Facebook's Dirt Perfect, uh, YouTube's Dirt Perfect, and uh, we do have a podcast channel. It's called A Few Points from Perfect. And uh, it's on all the major platforms, including YouTube. So okay. check it out. So appreciate you having me. Oh, I appreciate you doing it for us, man. Thanks sure. for coming out. Yep, no problem.